Trust me, Taylor Swift family. No, you can win some of this insane lab stuff. Oh my god, I can't even. Oh my god, she's beautiful, frankly. I have no words. I'm in Jersey. What would I? Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to Chair League. Um, you can't tell because he's not appearing for some reason or another. But uh, my buddy Mitch and teammate Mitch is here with us, also known as Baby Cthulhu. So let me find out why he is not appearing there. I mean, up there he goes. All right. I would now, really like to appear. Now you have appeared. All right. So uh, we're just waiting for the away team, uh, which is synergies to select a map. Then we'll get a lobby and a draft going. This is opening week of Chair League Season 3. We have two teams here today. One of them, Just Purple, is a placement team. And the other one, Synergies, is returning for their second season in Chair League. Uh, that's, uh, and they went 1-8 and eight last season. Um, Just Purple has some pretty experienced players on their roster, including one uh, who played on the pro team, uh, Ninja Hood, last season. So uh, those guys should be pretty good all right we have our map selection in so I'm gonna create the lobby and get these draft links moving and we will get this show on the road Mitch how you been you know I've been pretty good today Besides our game that we had earlier, I've been pretty good. Yeah, we had an unfortunate Hero League game where we were doing awesome and winning, and then our KT disconnected, and we had a bot, and uh, everything went to hell. I'm excited to try my hand at casting for the first time. So yeah, this, this is, uh, I'm, I'm certainly no pro at it, but this is Mitchell's first time doing it, so it should be fun. Oh, we got to get uh, one of our teams to actually start their players, so let's arrange that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do this real quick. Uh, tomb of the Spider Queen. There we go. Let's go ahead and make you and I observers. 
So if there's anybody in here who doesn't know what Chair League is, it is a recreational Heroes of the Storm League. We have all levels, Division 3, up to the Pro Division, Casual, up to Very Try Hard, and everything in between. Um, this map, I said, features one Division 3 team and one placement team. Okay, sorry for the silence there. Some administrative stuff here. Got one team in, got the other one coming. So who's our uh, home team and who's our away team? Our today? away team here is Synergies. They are a Division uh, three team that went one and eight last season. And our team on the left is just purple. That is our placement level team. Cool. Let's see, they said they did get there. Okay, I can do this. Oh, both are here. Oh, that's the other team. Sorry, we're uh, still a little growing pains this season as everybody gets used to the new system that Jova put in place about making sure rostered players are here. So I need to move one of these guys over to make sure we I can actually get the draft links because that is automated. So they chose Tomb of the Spider Queen tonight. They did, and that's the away team selection. That's one of the changes this year. Oh. Oh, it's just purple. Both of those guys. Okay. Sorry, we had a little snafu here. Now we are ready to go. Yeah, I'm seeing everybody here on the Chair League website. Yep, that's because I just moved them over. All right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. Where is it? No, nope, that's not what I wanted. Sorry, guys. He moves some stuff around here, so I'm still figuring this out. This should be a little better for next game that I don't have to figure out all this stuff that he changed while we're doing it. Okay. Oh, there it is. Got it. All right. Now we have what we need here. Okay. So I am sending out draft links now. All right, so we'll wait for people to get in here. Uh, again, our map's gonna be Tomb of the Spider Queen, so it's a very heavy pushing map. Uh, you know, we're gonna expect to see a lot of people like Zool, uh, Zagara is great on this map. Sylvanas is even good on this map as well. She can clear lanes really fast. She can help people clear lanes really fast. All true. I would be surprised if we saw Zagara um, this game, though. She will more than likely be banned, as she tends to be. All right. Draft links set out. Now we can go ahead and switch to our draft screen here. Perfect. All right, so just waiting for both teams to ready up. And um, <clears throat> I'm very curious to see how this game plays out. Like I said, uh, Synergies, uh, this is their second season, so they're uh, a ch veteran cheerleading team, although they did only win one game last, uh, last season. 
and although Just Purple is a newly formed team, and this will be officially their first game in Chair League, um, I try to do my research on these guys before going to the game so I can speak to what's going on. They're all very credible players and uh, you know, masters, diamond level players. So um, I think Synergies will have their work cut out for them. And we are off. Just Purple, first band Zag, just like we were talking about. She's uh, on the verge of getting a nerf next week, but for right now she mm. is still definitely um, totally overpowered. And Zool is the follow-up band. First pick now to Just Purple. And uh, Mitchell apparently has crashed, so I am soloing for a couple minutes here. Uh, lots of good first picks uh, available here. Anything that clears waves is good. Sylvanas accentuates the push uh, of the web weavers, and there's Sylvanas. Um, anything on this map that pushes or um, controls the turn in to prevent your other team from turning in the gems is, is really good. Two picks here uh, for synergies. Uh, fall stat is usually pretty highly prioritized in any competitive games, although this map is one of his weaker ones because it doesn't take full advantage of his mobility because he's so small. Um, but Gust is really good. Falstad does great damage still. And Greymane first pick, that's a little bit surprising. Um, he's fallen out of being highly prioritized um, with the changes to him recently. Um, he's still solid, does a lot of damage, um, but he's uh, vulnerable to CC and doesn't have a lot of self-sustain. So you really got to pick your spots with, you go, with him when you go into your wolf form so you don't get blown up. Second pick for Synergies is Leeming. All right, hopefully we'll get... Mitchell, back. you are back. I don't know either, but we have the double feedback, so um, mute your mic there and Skype for me. There, is that better? Much better. All right, so we had Greymane followed by Leeming picked up here, and we don't have you on camera right now. I'm going to see if I can fix that. We're having some technical difficulties here. There you are. All right, whoop. there you are. Okay, great. Now just purple on the clock for their second and third pick. Johanna picked up the best wave-clearing tank in the game, which is perfect on this map. If she takes that level 4 Eternal Retaliation, she can really clear really quickly. And now they have one more pick before we go to the ban phase. Synergies picked up Lee Bing here. It's not a popular pick for this map. Got a player that's really good. It's it's kind of hard to give that one away. Yeah, and she does synergize well with Greymane because if Greymane dives in appropriately, he can help her secure her resets. The two of them do combo for a lot of damage, so that's one thing to consider is their synergy with one another. Absolutely, they can 100 to zero people pretty fast. Just Purple's comp though right now is going to dominate the laning phase. Uh, Thrall is probably the second best solo laner in the game after Zag. Johanna is the best wave clearing tank. Sylvanas uh, is, especially once she gets into her build a little bit, clears not, not so much early, but once she gets past seven, can really clear those waves really quickly. So um, Synergist is going to need to respond to that, or they're going to be chasing minions the whole game. What kind of ban are we looking for here, Mitchell? Uh, well, that, well that, that's a good ban. That, uh, that's a great ban. You know, Kerrigan and Thrall are really going to do some damage to people. And they don't even want to have to deal with that. So it's yeah, a know, great ban for them. Normally I wouldn't wouldn't be thinking of those two paired together. But as we learned with our new team's first game this week, Kerrigan and Thrall are apparently awesome together because that combo absolutely wrecked us just earlier this week. Yeah. So I would expect uh, either a healer or a tank isolation, and, and there you go with the uh, Tyrael. Pairs really well with Greymane, so taking that Sanctification off the board. Absolutely, taking even something like Protection and Death off the board as well. Being able to give Greymane 50% shields is really powerful. So being able to take him off the board is a really smart ban by just Purple. Yeah, and I'm curious if synergies, you know, Uther does really well with Greymane, so if they would have taken Uther for the Divine Shield. 
Um, Ariel still on the board, and she's man, she's really. I think as far as balance and strength and prioritization and competitive, she's come out of the gates, I think, stronger without being overpowered better than any other hero Blizzard has put out in this game. You know, it must feel really good if you're a Blizzard designer right now to uh, hit it pretty with a new hero and have her so prominently featured in, uh, you know, regionals that are coming around and, and even smaller recreational leagues like this. Yeah, and, and with nobody crying about how OP she is. They just kind of hit the nail just on the head but without going crazy with it. We're going to see ETC picked up here for Synergy, so we're going to... They're still deciding on their second pick here. Now, ETC is one of the best tanks in the game. Um, however, he's got really bad wave clear, and that's a real weakness for their comp right now. Now, Rhaegar will help that a little bit, because for a healer, he has good wave clear. Um, but they're still behind the 8-ball in the wave clear department. Um, synergies is, and I may be maybe thinking Azul on this back. Oh no, Azul's banned out. Yeah, so they really need somebody who can clear these waves out fast. Uh, Falstad would help with that a little bit. After he gets Boomerang, he has pretty good wave clear, and he is still sitting on the board. There's Lunara. Speaking of strong wave clear, we're gonna have Lunara come out here for Just Purple. Yeah, Just Purple really's got a strong composition here. And the and Ariel, there's the Ariel we were talking about. She, and she combos so well with any characters that have poison, like Lunara and Zul's Poison Nova, because she can use her heal, and then it, that hope just starts popping back up right over again. I really like just Purple's composition here. You know, it's crazy. Not only is the Lunara a good combo with her, but the Thrall with Empathic Link at 7 is going to be just absolutely destroying everything that Synergy is about yeah, Last pick, we're gonna have an Azebo. Well, that'll help their wave clear a little bit, but um, I will tell you, Just Purple, in addition to wave clear, has a pretty mobile team as well. Um, Nazebo might have a little bit of a problem with that, so we'll see how this game goes. We're gonna get in the lobby here and get this game on the road. You know, I uh, I think just Purple really won this draft. They uh, I, I just don't see a facet of team composition that I'd like better out of Synergies as comp. You know, they may have picked based on their own preferences and what they had left to them, but just Purple got a beastly draft here when it comes to the map and when it comes to the performance that they're going to be able to output on this map right now. Yeah, you know, and it's 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 very traditional. You know, you've got your double front line, your healer, your damage dealers, your specialist. It's in a very by the book. And here we go. Game is officially starting. Let's go ahead and switch screens here. So we are going on Tomb of the Spider Queen with Just Purple versus Synergies. For Just Purple, we are going to have Team Captain Puppy on Johanna, Furious Fro on Sylvanas, Ariel played by Legend Doggy, Lunara played by O.O. Putz, and Thrall played by Rourke. Would you want to call out Synergies there? Yeah, and over on the side of Synergies, we are going to have Redbeard on ETC. We are going to have Poop Pellet on Nazebo. Gotta love that name. We are going to have Nai on Lee Ming. Space Pope on Rhaegar, and X-Ray 32, repping that great me. Doom is one of my favorite maps, um, but it can be a little bit snowball-y in that if one team controls the turn in, it just gets brutal. And it's a catch-22 because if you're not, if you're being prevented from turning in your gems, you can have one or two people just holding this colossal horde of gems, and you have to play conservative so you don't lose them, which leads you to not fight as hard for those turn-ins, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, another thing you mentioned, too, is the mobility as well. This being the smallest map in the game, if you have a mobile team, you are at a much better advantage on this map as opposed to teams that take longer to get around. Yeah, you know, what I expect um, Just Purple to do is I expect them to stick Thrall in one of these lanes and have a four-man rotation with the other one between Sylv and Johanna and Lunara and Ariel, they could clear fast and move on, and, and I really think um, Synergies is going to have an issue in this laning phase. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I did already. Yeah. Don't make me think I'm crazy. I already zoomed out. Okay. <laughs> so we've zoomed in on the stream. We've got uh, the five man from just purple here clumping in the middle, and Synerges wants zero part, no part of this whatsoever. No, they are absolutely understanding that they are going to lose that team fight if they go in the middle there. We're going to have Zebo here take the bottom. It looks yep, like and he's going to be showing here bottom too, so he needs to be really careful not to go too far out. As does Greymane. Yep, no fear from just purple. And here's going to be the little skirmish. Power slide in from ETC. Johanna, of course, is not going to get picked off. Pops the iron skin, walks away. Oriole's going to be, uh, sorry, Lunara's going to be the target for Oriole here. And you can see already just how fast she fills up that bar. Absolutely. And and this look at, that, look at how fast these, these waves are going to melt. Um, ETC is not going to be able to do anything with it. Johanna didn't even need to use her Condemn to help clear that. Yep, and that's a big win for them because now they have to send help and they already are having a hard time keeping up with this wave clear. I will say so far, just purple, their formation has been really tight. Johanna has been in front with the damage dealers in back, just how you should be. And leaving Thrall alone in that bottom lane is not going to be a very good idea. We're going to see the Zebo go down there and take a lot of damage as well. Yeah, and, and the problem is is that Synergist doesn't have a lot of options as to send someone down there to help him because they're losing the four-man as well as the bottom lane. I mean, Rhaegar might go down here due to the poison. Nice detaining strike there. Greymane and Rhaegar wow, were both on the verge of death. Very low on death. Yeah. Very low on health. My goodness. Just purple is really dominating this laning phase here. ETC is really low, and he's got to walk back again. Synergies is is just having issues here. ETC walks back into the Johanna and gets picked off. All right, we're gonna have another pick here for Gravy. That's gonna be the first two kills of the game going to just purple. Yeah, and I just don't. I mean, I think we're having more technical difficulties. It is not our damage. I don't think we're getting any sound effects from the game itself on the stream right now. It's just the two of us troning on, which is certainly not entertaining, I'm sure. And the Zebo dies to Thrall in the bottom lane. Well, while they're taking this top wall, I'm going to see if I can fix this real quick. Now I kind of hear it. All right, let's go a little higher. Thrall still being left alone in bottom lane. Yeah. He's just going to be able to take care of that. He's got over 16 gems. That's going to be a lot to turn in. Yeah, and like I said, the problem is Synergies just doesn't have any other choice. They're losing this four-man just as hard as they're losing that Thrall solo lane in the bot. Here's that snowball you're talking about. They're already two levels down, and that's going to be really hard to take over, especially at this early in the game. Well, and look at the gem count on the bottom. 29 to 50, basically. Just purple has a really high advantage here, and they're just going to let Thrall turn in right there on the bottom. They only need seven more to get a turn in. Yep, and they're going to get oh, that turn in Zeebo here. get rooted as well. Oh, okay, he's going to take some damage and get away safely. Oh, Sylvanas may be caught out, but she had the Windrunner available. And it looks like Rhaegar is probably going to go here. Not quite, but Johanna just barely pops the iron skin to get out alive. She was really alive by the skin of her teeth. Greymane trying for a flank here. He might be able to put some work on the Lunara, but didn't want to risk diving in so aggressively. Well, they have caught up in even levels right now. They're basically a level behind, but they, they seem to have trimmed it down a tiny little bit here. They are now a talent here behind trying to turn in. Doesn't look like they're going to be able to get it at first. ETC is going to slide in. And he is taking a members. lot of damage, yeah. as is Lunara and Rhaegar. But yeah, Rhaegar and ETC are both going to fall here. And he may just a little late on the engagement. They're not going to be able to get any damage off. Yeah, it's, it's hard in a competitive setting to do a four man turn in like that with the whole other team alive. I think you would like to see ETC out a little forward and try to zone for his teammates rather than all of them trying to turn in simultaneously because that just doesn't happen very much in a competitive setting. No, 
Now, Nazebo is being left alone down there in bottom lane, but it's not going to matter because we have our first turn of the game here. It's going to just purple. Yep, and with Sylvanas and a two-level lead or a one-and-a-half-level lead, they're really going to, I think, take advantage of this. You know, that's the problem, too. Getting behind when you have a Sylvanas on the other team, her trait is going to allow her to push so much harder just because of that level difference. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you're on the defense, you can kind of use your towers and walls as a fifth man a little bit or sixth man a little bit, but not with Sylvanas there. So Synergiz is definitely on the back foot here. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Look, at Greymane is sitting on 23 gems. And he's the guy you want diving in doing the damage, but he's also, you don't want to drop those 23 gems. So really, he really has to walk a tightrope between preserving those gems and doing his job of dealing damage. We are going to see Just Purple here all rotate down to the bottom lane as the synergies is split up. They're going to get some damage done here. It looks like they already got the fort and top. Yeah, and... That was a poor decision by by Nazebo and and by ETC here. This is basically a one v five. When both of them went in there, you're not going to accomplish much doing that. And it looks like we had a DC. We'll see if someone calls for a pause here. Nobody's called for a pause yet. And level ten reached and almost an ace um, by just purple. And I think this game might start to get out of hand here a little bit. You know, they're right about to be four, three levels down still. And yeah, and there goes yeah, Nazebo. Thrall's barreling in, and, and the forts just can't help them with Sylvanas, you know? And they are already going to get that wall down there. They're going to try to go for this keep as well. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't surprise me if they get another pick, if they just keep going. Uh, I mean, you, you just never know. You know. if you can stagger deaths long enough, there's no reason to back off. Yeah, and I do like... This is a really tough spot for synergies because you need to have people in lanes here to soak. Um, but actually, Greymane, did he sneak a turn in? Oh, he should have. He was up here. He should have snuck the turn in, but he didn't. And now he's going to get caught. Yeah, he. I thought he was up at the turn in sneaking it, and he should have. He would have gotten it. And he should do it right now if he's going to be up there. Either turn in or get out of dodge. There he goes. Finally he turns in. Now we're at four level difference, 12 to 8, seven minutes into the game. Grayman was unable to unload his 23 gems. One of the reasons he should have just done it is I don't think Just Purple cared if he turned in his gems. You know, it really didn't matter to them in the end game. No, but it was important for, for uh, Synergist here. If they ever didn't get back in it, they couldn't lose those. So, um, You know, we're going to see one more turn in here by Just Purple, and this may be the last turn in the Game. Yeah, we, we could see a sub 10 minute game here if things go wrong or right, depending on who you are. And Synergiz is exposed here in the middle. They're really far they forward. Gonna and on you're going right to see now. a Sundering come out here. There it is. Wow. And this is probably going to be an ace, with the exception of Nazebo. is just all over that back line. Yeah. Rhaegar might be able to wolf away. Um, Lunara was, that was an bot Lunara. Who was diving all over the place? Having too is you know, just purple is rotating as five. They are being able to use their level lead to their advantage and just death ball. Absolutely. Synergies and just knock them around. Yeah. And still having Zebo down here separated on the bottom lane. Yeah, he's trying so hard to get ten. I know why he's down there. He's trying to get to level ten and get his team on something closer to even footing. And he's gonna get it, and you're gonna have a fight over core here, I think. Up, and get the third one. Bank. We are here nine minutes into this game, and Synergiz might be without any structures left on the field. See, now at this point, Nazebo needs to come up. You've got your 10. You can't let your team fight five on four here. Um, I mean, you don't want to fight down a talent tier, but the way this game is going, they're not going to have a choice but to fight down a talent tier the rest of this game. No, when, when you don't have a choice like that, yeah. you really got to cut your losses. Absolutely. And Nazebo is still down at the bottom split pushing and uh, I wonder if that just might be the white flag that might be what gives them the game you know the uh, synergies here turned in but I don't think it's gonna matter I don't think it's gonna matter either they're this core they're already putting damage on, on the core, core. Graymane doing an okay job of trying to put out damage but 
one on five, that's what's going to happen. Nazebo is finally back to help out with defense. Core sitting at 80% and slowly going down. Members of Just Purple are getting low. They might be able to hold them off here. Oh, there's the Crystal Aegis on a Thrall. Oh, that's a lot of damage. Three members down on the Crystal Aegis. But they still, they're so life that they can't stand under the core. They're going to have to hearth back. Otherwise, the core will kill them. Greymane, hurry, you can get one. Go, no! He wasn't able. There were two meaty targets for Greymane to just dive on there, and he wasn't able to get either. Fortunately, he didn't take a sharp enough turn there. I feel like he could have gotten them. Yeah, they... He, they must have been just out of sight for him. I, I think if he would have seen him, he would have gotten one of them. So they do manage to hold off, but, I mean, it's going to take a small miracle for Synergies to turn this around. They're down three levels, and they have Katas pushing on every lane. It's going to be a tight defense for sure. I mean, they're basically... They finally forming that death ball, that five man. They're trying to look for skills and fix here. The one thing that the... The web weavers did push out the lanes for them, so that's going to help initially. Um, but I think just purple, they're they're smelling yeah, blood here. Arrow, followed up by a sundering. The detainment the strike. strike on is gonna take him down. This is going to be game here. Just purple, they they smell the blood. Blood in the water, and they're going to go for the jugular. They're going to finish this off. There goes etc. ETC slides in, gets picked off. Yeah, that that's going to be game. So it's going to be about a 12 minute game here. A dominant victory for Just Purple. Um, that's kind of what I was saying in the beginning. These these guys are no slouches, and, and Puppy has um, pretty high-level competitive experience. So I think this team is um, going to place fairly high in the divisions uh, once they finish out their placement games. Um, I mean... Uh, definitely made a strong showing. Yeah, and, and you know, props to Synergies for hanging in there. That those those types of games can definitely be frustrating. Um, they gave it their all. They had a valiant core defense there, where they did manage to keep the game going a little bit. Um, but I think both of us felt like that one was kind of lost in the draft. You know, it really was. Uh, this is something that you have to concentrate on when you are drafting. It's not just drafting for your team, but also drafting. For that does say something about uh, synergies, but you know, just purple had good bands, they had good picks, they had good first picks and last picks. You know, Sylvanas was picked up first for them, so mm. they tried to secure their lead really early. Yeah, they did, but I mean, the wave clear was just too much, and we saw that from minute one of this game, um, and it just it it never. It never went anywhere. You, you kind of felt like uh, Synergies was just never able to get their footing. Um, and one of the things about mm -hmm. Chair League is the way placements are done, the early season games um, can be a little bit not as competitive as you'd like because um, the way the league is set up is that um, teams with like records are... Play, placed against one another. So in the beginning when everybody is 0-0, the games are a little bit at the whim of uh, the scheduler, and especially with placement teams, you really don't know where they're going to be at. So um, that is one of the drawbacks of the early part of the Chair League season. As the season goes on, the games do get much more competitive. Yeah, that's going to be a hard loss for uh, Synergies to swallow, but you know it is kind of at the mercy of whatever matchmaker Jova has set out there. Yeah, and, and I would be surprised if we didn't see uh, just purple placed in at least into Division Two. And but I, I think they're gonna they're gonna be in Division One. Um, they're they're very good. And you know, one of the fun things, and not so much in this match, but more speaking generally, um, since we do have about 20 minutes to kill before our next game, one of the fun things um, about Cherly when you're doing Division Three or placement um, is you get kind of off meta picks. You never know what you're going to see. You'll see some kind of weird strategies and different things that uh, you don't see it necessarily the pro play or even the high-level competitive play. And that is kind of the fun of Chair League as well. You do get to see some of those, you know, random picks come out. You get to see some of those weird strategies come out. But, you know, this was pretty straightforward. It felt like everybody's build looks like it's, it's pretty on point with 
uh, you know, what is trending and hot slogs. But, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, as a, from a caster's perspective, you know, when the, when the pro casters do these pro tournaments or whatever, they have a lot of homework that they can do. They know the player pools of the players, and they know the strategies that the teams have been running and their success in the past. And, you know, I do a little bit of homework if I can, but a lot of this information isn't available to us. So when we talk about the drafts and um, heroes they should or shouldn't pick and how we, we're not aware of the player's player pool or what the team's been running or any of that. We're kind of flying by the seat of our pants trying to think like they will and what they're doing and, and what we would do with our hero's experience in that position. Yeah, it is hard to come at the draft as kind of a third-party observer here just trying to come up with picks. So we do have a second game at 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. It is a placement game. So uh, placement games are like the wild, wild west of chair league. Um, you just don't know what you're going to get. So I know those teams are raring to go. Uh, but we have about 20 minutes to kill. Let me see. Uh, oops. Oh, hey, we apparently we're not partying anymore. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, my PC crash kicked me out of that party. Yeah, I noticed right in the middle of that you kind of went MIA there. Let's see uh, how those guys are doing here. We might be able... See, you know, Halloran suggested, and I think it was an excellent suggestion, that uh, they change, that he changed the scheduling structure to where instead of the games are 30 minutes apart, they're 40 minutes apart. Um, that way you could schedule back-to-back -back games and not have to make somebody wait, because most of these games run 30 to 40 minutes. So like right now, I schedule back-to-back -back games an hour apart. If you have a quick game, you're kind of sitting around for a little bit. And it's just not quite long enough for us to do a quick match and stream it. I don't think so. No, not quite. Almost. Almost. Well, I tell you what. Um, I have a little bit of an issue I need to deal with real quick because um, my little one is apparently sick. So I'm going to mute myself and go to the loading screen, and we're going to chill for about 10 minutes, and then we'll get back on and get ready to cast our second game of the night. Sounds good.
Welcome back, everybody. We are here for second game of the evening. For it's going to be a placement match: painfully average versus av or versus lit leaf green. And our map today will be Dragonshire. Uh, we are in lobby, and draft links uh, have been sent out. So we're really just waiting for teams to ready up. So uh, let's talk about Dragonshire a little bit. Mitch, what do you prioritize when you are on this map? False stat, 100%. Well, you know, in general, this is going to be one of those maps where you want people with global mobility. This is one of those maps where it forces you to split up in order to get those shrines. And you need to be able to get around the map fast. And false stat is one of the best. If not the best. If not the best, I think. I, I agree. It's going to be another choice, you know. She's a little bit more limited. She needs a, somebody to blink in on in order to be useful in that way. But she can provide some powerful backup as well. I uh, would ask if you think we would see Dahaka to do the global, but I think the answer is no. You know, it's a niche pick. There are a lot of people who do like Dahaka, and the people who do can definitely play him very well. But you don't see him very often, so if we do see him tonight, that's a very strong pick for whoever team gets it, but we'll see. Well, and we're going to have a first ban, KT. And I'll, t I'll tell you why I like that ban, is because that means Painfully Average guarantees themselves Falstad or Zagara. Um, Absolutely. So and because we're seeing the Zagara ban out on the side of the lit, we are probably going to see a first pick Falstad here for Painfully Average. We do have a request from the audience, Mitchell, if you turn up your audio just a little bit. Where are you hearing me again? Are you hearing me in Skype or are you hearing me in... You are in my Discord. In Discord. Mm -hmm. You can turn me up there too. I could. But I think it would... Try first. Yeah, I think it would mess up my uh, setup here. So Rhaegar is a surprising first pick from Painfully Average. And Litleaf Green now has Falstad on the table. Uh, Sylvana still on the table. She really accentuates that push uh, from the DK when you get it. Um, one of the things about this map is if you can control the lanes, you can control the Dragon Knight. Thrall's an excellent pick uh, because without Zagara, he's the best um, laner in the game. And uh, Twitch chat there, let me know if Mitch is coming in a little bit better now, okay? We're going to test this here. I hope I'm not too loud for anybody. One more, one more pick for Litleaf Green, and this is a placement match. Um, the results of I think it's three. Last season it was four placement matches determined if you would place into Division One, Two, or Three. This year I think Jova lowered it to three. He says you're still super quiet. Yeah, you're gonna want to turn me up at Discord. I think. Okay, so we have Thrall and Falstad first and second pick, uh, both really good. Those are two really <laughs> strong picks to have in the first pick there for your draft. Uh, the Rhaegar was the first pick for Painfully Average. You hate to see uh, the Thrall and the Falstad, or the, uh, sorry, the Falstad slip away from Painfully Average there. Um, let me know if that's better. I turned them up there, Twitch chat. And now we have a Kerrigan and a Zul. This is going to be four melee characters from the Painfully Average side because they're going to pick up a tank. That's really melee heavy. You know, something that's actually coming around in the meta is the more melee the better it seems like when you can lock down people the kerrigan stun the rhaegar slow the zul root you secure yourself a kill you know and if that's something that they were targeting that kind of explains that kael'thas ban actually because his living bomb spread really punishes heavy melee teams and you wonder if that's something they had in their heads you know i was just thinking that as well they didn't even want to have to deal with that living bomb and, you know, the uh, Lit is actually picking up on what they're throwing down here with a Tyrael ban as well. It's a very, very smart ban on the side of Lit Leaf Green. Yeah, you definitely don't want all of those melee characters um, in a Sanctification. And uh, Painfully Average banning out additional global um, from Lit Leaf in the form of Brightwing. So we have a pretty interesting draft sorting itself out here. What's you know, the... I really do like the uh, Zul pickup here by Painfully Average. When you have everybody split like that, Zul becomes a powerhouse because if he stays in that mid lane, he's kind of alone there. 
Yeah, I, I'm thinking we're going to see an ETC here. I was thinking that would be the tank for Litleaf because if you catch all of those melees in that mosh pit, it's going to turn into a big-time dance party. So um, that could be a punishing pick. Uh, all this, although Le ETC, although good as... Another, another punishing pick here for Lit Leaf Green is going to be the Sylvanas. She is going to be able to help that Dragon Knight push like no other. Well, furthermore, if you have these melees clumping too close together, you can have a really punishing Wailing Arrow. Ex exactly. Yep, there's the ETC. You called it. Yeah, I mean, the ETC Mosh Pit is going to be good if he can land a lot of these melees in here. Um, but the, the flip side of that is he's not the tankiest of tanks, so if he gets himself caught in the middle of all these melees, um, he could get blown up as well. So you really want to be careful, um, especially if you power slide in, because that means you can't power slide out. We're going to see Murden and Leeming picked up here for Painfully Average. That is a great pick for Painfully Average. That Leeming is going to be able to stay in the back and get some burst damage out on some of these squishier targets here. That Thrall and the ETC are a great front line, but if they get hit by orbs and missiles, they can go down pretty fast. All true, and Muradin is just generally awesome. I mean, he's just like a prototypical tank. If you want a tank, you pick Muradin. He's just so good. There's a lot of things he does well. There is so much lockdown on the side of Painfully Average with the Stormbolt on Muradin. That gets followed up by another stun for the Kerrigan, possibly a root and a slow from either the Zul or the Rhaegar. This is looking pretty good on the side of Painfully Average. Yeah, but it, but they will be clumped a lot, and uh, Falstad's Q does a lot of damage. So they, they got to be aware of their positioning, and with that many melee characters, it does make positioning a little bit tougher. Uh, and they go with the Uther. Uther, always good. Um, he doesn't have a prototypical Divine Shield target, that melee assassin who really dives in. But there's going to be a lot of pressure on whoever that support player is for Lit Leaf Green to be clean with his cleanses to make sure that that lockdown doesn't blow up its intended target. Absolutely. It, you know, being painfully average right now, you might be a little scared of that Uther pick. Divine Moshes are a serious thing that you cannot interrupt him out of after he gets Divine Shielded. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of eggs in one basket with two high cooldown um, ultimates. All, but it's also one of the. <laughs> it's also one of the few things in this game that is actually there's nothing you can do about it if you execute it. Yes, it is a lot of eggs to put in one basket, and they're going to have to have their timing and their uh, their execution pretty on point in order to pull something like that off. We're going to go ahead to our game screen. That will also allow me to change the team names to reflect who we actually have here. So let's go ahead and do that. The blue team this time is... a name that I like, Painfully Average, and the red team this game will be there we go, that looks better see, before I'm too quiet now I'm too loud <laughs> well you can adjust your right. mic settings though, yeah we can try this tell me how that is chat yeah we, we're trying to find that happy medium it hasn't been our day for technical execution today also uh, chat let me know about the volume of the game itself uh, I think it was too soft in the first game so let me know if it needs to be adjusted all right on the blue team painfully average we have brew on Muradin slow chill on Zul berserk on Rhaegar warfang on Kerrigan and scrog on Li Ming Right, and on the side of the lit leaf green, we are going to have Raven X on the Falstad, J Rad on the Thrall, Ice on Sylvanas, Teddy Bear on ETC, and Sidor on Uther. So it looks like uh, Painfully Average wants no part of the uh, little scrim here in the middle. That surprises me a little bit with all of the stuns and lockdowns you have. You think they would be the team that could pick somebody here, but. Um, Muradin is just uh, having a little one-man show in the middle, and Litleaf Green has nobody to ambush. 
And actually, there is the one-man show on Murd, and he is busting out the moves for the minion wave. All right, so everyone down to lanes. We have Zul solo laning top against Falstad. Uh, I will tell you from a caster's perspective, this uh, map, in my opinion, is one of the trickier ones to move the observer camera because there tends to be stuff going on all over the place. Thrall is caught out, and that was an excellent uh, combination of crowd control between the Stormbolt, Kerrigan's combo, and the slowing totem from Rhaegar. Looks like we're still having a game volume I heard issue that. Here. Let me see if we can fix that. I hate doing this in game. We, it looks like we are having uh, a painfully average form of four man here and rotate in between the mid and the bottom. How's that? I so think. Us... Go nope. Ahead, go ahead. I think that fixed the game volume because I'm hearing it better now, too. Let me know, chat. <laughs> yeah, this is the Blizzard interface one, and it's not very good as far as the overlay goes. I'm going to have to switch to another one, but I won't have time to do it tonight, obviously. So I think the game volume should be fixed. And here we go back to the game. We're going to sort this out for tomorrow, Mitchell, I swear. <laughs> We're going to have it perfect by tomorrow. Zul might be in trouble up at the top here. Here's the counter pick. They're going to avenge the thrall, and they will. Teddy Bear on yeah, E.T. Slee a, had just enough range on that power slide. That. that was a very good pick. He was just able to clip him with that power slide and lock down E.T.C. for the pick here. And it looks like uh, Painfully Average is going to take it to them in the bottom. Yep. They are trying to get that wall down. And they will. They are absolutely going to get this wall. So far, only Sylvanas responding. Um, but you have a counter push in the mid lane that didn't really accomplish very much. So basically, uh, Painfully Average traded Zul for the bottom wall. You know, this is something that you don't really see a lot is the Sylvanas by herself. She is a great laner, she is a great enabler, but she is even better with somebody else with her on her side. She can help people push a lot more than she can push herself. Yeah, absolutely. I would call her kind of average in the solo laning department. She can do it, but it's just not what she's best at. If you put her in the lane with somebody else, that's really where she's going to excel. Just missing the wolf from Thrall to lock down the Leeming. And Sylvanas caught. They dove into the fort range to get the Sylvanas, and she is picked. Right now, Painfully Average has a little bit of control in this game. They have three men pushing, four men pushing, with giants on this bottom fort. And as of yet, no response from Lit Leaf Green. They almost look like they're conceding the fort. You know, they took that camp early, and they knew that they didn't even need to get the Dragon Knight. They just wanted to push in that bottom as hard as possible, and unfortunately, Leaf Green let them. Yep, those Giants are going to finish it off. You know, this this is something that on this map, um, I think, is one of the harder maps, maps for team execution, and uh, teams that uh, aren't quite as skilled um, almost focus on the Dragon Knight too much, in, in my humble opinion. It's not that you don't want to get the Dragon Knight, but that's not what you focus on. You focus on controlling the lanes, and if you control the lanes and get a couple of picks, that allows you to take the Dragon Knight. We're seeing Painfully Average try to set up here for a gank. Down and the bottom, we've ETC got is walking in right camera. into it. Oh, does he smell something, or is he... Eh, he's just out of Kerrigan's reach. He might smell something's wrong there. He wants to get aggressive, you can see it in him, but he knows he, he knows better at this point. Yeah, you know, the chat room is obso observing that uh, Painfully Average is really focusing on this bottom lane. We finally have a hard rotation from Lit Leaf Green. He, Falstad puts out there a lot of go. damage and takes down the Lee Ming. Muradin at low health, but he will get away. Rhaegar and Kerrigan... Oh, if took that bottom they did... And That's Falstad is flying to help Thrall in the top. No, they're going to go for the DK, and they will get it. A quick turnaround for Litleaf Green, getting a pick and using the global to secure the first Dragon Knight of the game. Very smart. That Zul didn't want to mess with that uh, Sylvanas up there in top, so she, he just let him have it. Now, what, what I, what I want to see Lit Leaf do here is have that three-man push on the bottom with the Dragon Knight on the top. You're going to get a push somewhere. 
And the way for that to work is the DK can't do what he's doing here. He needs to kind of just back up and maximize his time with it while his teammates push in that bottom lane. You can see on the mini map that. They're trying to use that Dragonite as a distraction here, and they're trying to do what uh, Painfully Average did to them and push in that bot really hard. Here comes Sylvanas. She's going to help enable those Giants in that push really well. Yeah. But it looks like they're going to back off here. They did employ that strategy. They just took a little bit too long to get into it, so they didn't get as much out of the bottom lane as they would have liked. You know, uh, chat noticed how much uh, Painfully Average is really focusing on that bottom lane, and uh, it's because you have two giants pushing on it, it, it's a really important lane that way. And this map is unique in that the middle lane is the only one that doesn't have uh, mercenaries pushing down, pushing down it. Both of the other lanes have mercs pushing on it. In, you know, on this map, mid lane is both the most important and the least important on this map. It's where you get the Dragon Knight, but it's you're right, there are nobody that pushes there, so you kind of have to concentrate on these other lanes. Yeah, absolutely, and, and you know, a lot of time with the mercs, that's when you open up your win condition is on the uh, on the side lanes. Man, Looks like we're going to have 10 for both, uh, both teams, teams here. Li Ming's going to take Wave of Force. Ancestral Healing's going to come out for Rhaegar. Skeletal Mages is going to come out for the Zul. Maelstrom for Kerrigan, and it looks like Avatar for Malfury. And thank you Sorry, for calling. For thank you for calling that out because my observer interface is being terrible. We're gonna have to fix this before tomorrow. I'll keep going. Then Sundering <laughs> is gonna be the pick for Thrall. Uh, we're gonna have Gust come out here for Falstead. The Wailing Arrow for Sylvanas. Mosh Pit on the ETC, and the Divine Shield on the Uther, just like we said. Now I know. Uh, Raven on Falstad. Oh, we have a split sundering there. It splits the team in half, but this team's a little late on the follow-up. Offensive gust into the mosh pit. It's into the divine mosh pit. Yeah, oh, it's a little bit awkward. They weren't quite as synergized as they would like to be, but it is working. Zul will go down, and painfully average was forced to retreat. The idea was there, and the execution was just a touch late, I give it a B, because if they would have had A-plus execution there, that would have been an ace. Lit Leaf Green definitely sniffed that out, and they wanted to stop that before it even started, and they did a great job. Yeah, you know, Painfully Average looked to take control of this in the beginning, but Lit Leaf Green in, in a better spot now. Push on top with the Mercs. Uther, oh, he missed! Uther's he missed on the it. Wave of Light, and that allowed Painfully Average to get the DK just that far from it. He could have gotten that if he was just that much closer. He, he needed one more step and he would have been able to do it. One more step. You're going to see a heavy push in mid here on the side of Painfully Average. The good thing for Lit Leaf Green here, it looks like they've got Mercs in top and, and bottom, bottom lane. To do some work for them. Absolutely. You know, it's it's if this fight turns into a, a you know, a long protracted thing, that's not bad for them. You can see on the top lane that that fort is low. We have Giants pushing on the bottom lane, so they're up in level a little bit, and they have some push. At the end of this DK, they will be down in structures, but it's really not all bad. They can still turn this around if they want to. You know, what we didn't talk about in the draft when we were saying with the four-man melee, uh, the one thing about melee characters, or not the one thing, but one of the things about melee characters is that if you fall behind in level, it's very tough to team fight. So it is, uh, yeah, you're right. It is that much harder. Oh, we're gonna see. Fall oh, Li Ming went Lee right Lee into the, the team, followed by the Sundering and the Wailing Arrow on Muradin. The wailing Arrow is gonna keep Muradin out of that fight, and a great pick is gonna come out for the side of Lit. Lee it was a good pick, but it was also an expensive pick. That was three ultimates to pick off Li Ming. And now Lit Leaf Green tried to keep the map pressure on. They will take the neutral bruisers in the bottom lane. They are doing everything in their power to take this game back and yep. taking that bruiser down there. And it looks like we may have a fight steps. here. ETC is coming, but he's a hair late to the party. Painfully average would do best to withdraw from this. It's a 13 to 12 and Li Ming not quite here yet. Sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. We see the Thrall here taking an aggressive position, trying to look for picks. Both he's going to slide in. Both they're not going to be able to get anything done here. Now both teams at 13, but uh, Lit Leaf Green's the onto the ETC. The Divine Shield comes out the same time as the Gust does. 
So you what? Know, the gust really helped against those skeletal mages, and of course the divine shield helped that ETC. Survive. Absolutely, I think probably in, in, any one of those would have gotten the job done, but they really had the insurance policy there to make sure everybody got out safe and sound. You know, I'm surprised we didn't see a uh, Poison Nova pick come out here for the Zool. He did take shade, uh, sorry, Backlash at the beginning. The Backlash plus the Poison Nova grants Zool and a tremendous amount of burst against the other team. Not only that, as if uh, you do it as a follow-up on the Kerrigan combo, they can't get away from it, really. Exactly. So we have a very close game here. Uh, structurally, Painfully Average is just very slightly, very slightly ahead, and Litleaf Green is about a half a level ahead in experience. Looks like they're going to split the shrines with Painfully Average taking the top shrine, while Litleaf Green is going to take the bottom shrine. Painfully Average is going to push with these top mercs. That's a good decision, and Falstad is going to choose to take the bottom fort at the same time, so they're going to trade out forts here. Um, Sylvanas will eventually win this exchange, but at this point, that will get rid of all of Litleaf Green's level 1 structures, while Painfully Average will still have two left. So, from Painfully Average's perspective, I like that trade. And now you have to wonder, is Litleaf Green getting a little bit greedy? They are going for the front wall on the keep. And they got yeah, it. They know it's going to take them a while to get down there, and it looks like they just want the wall, and they're going to get it. They are, yeah, that was well played. Sylvanas is the one that allows you to do stuff like that. And Painfully Average seemed a little bit indecisive in their response. They started to be back initially. Muradin caught out here. He might be in trouble. All five on Muradin. Avatar popped. The Avatar comes out, and he's trying to get he's away. He's trying to get away, and there's the Ancestral with the Kerrigan combo. Nope, no combo, just the Q. Uh, there's the gu offensive gust again. This is turning into a brouhaha here. Sundering goes out. Ancestral went out. Gust went out. Both teams a full five on five brawl. There's the divine shield to keep Thrall alive, but there's Uther will fall. Down, if you're going to have somebody fall first, Uther is not a bad person to do it as he can ghost heal his teammates, so that's not the worst thing in the world. That was a great team fight on both sides. Unfortunately, the Uther was just out of position there when everybody was trying to retreat. Now we're going to have Rhaegar and Zul take oh, the Oh, who's going to get it? Li Ming, Ming is, is going to get it before Dragonite. Falstad can take the top. Now Falstad's going to have to go the long way and walk back. So they are looking yeah. to get a keep wall here. Um, and they do have the 16 to 15 tier advantage. Falstad needs to be very careful. If they see him up there, he is fried chicken. Falstad is taking a very aggressive position here right before his gust comes out. And yeah, and there's the gust right well. into the fort. There were some skeletons to sink it. They are going to turn it around on him and be able to pick off the Falstad. Yeah, I think what would have been better there for Falstad, the gust wasn't a bad idea, but he should have just flown over rather than try to walk through the enemy team there. He had the right idea to follow up there and try to split the team, but of course he got turned around on. Now we're going to see him go down as well. Looks like they're trying to get the Uther and or the Great ball. Sundering disengage. Sundering, and they get the Muradin pick as well in the conversion. Now they have to retreat through the enemy fort. This is going to be a very interesting disengage. Can he hit the wolf? Can he hit the wolf? No wolf follow-up from Thrall. So wow, the ET... <laughs> the <laughs> they didn't Sorry, get the, the fort uh, or the keep. No, they did not get that keep at all. You know, it's pretty close to going down, but they didn't do what they probably wanted to do there. Yeah, they, they got a little blood bloodthirsty there looking for the kills, and they didn't finish the keep. I mean, somebody can go over there and fall on that thing, and that keep is probably going to go down. <laughs> this is still a close game, although Painfully Average has taken control of the map. You can see there's blue all over the place, and they have only lost one fort. Litleaf Green is on the verge of losing a keep. But both teams still at level 17. You know, even levels here, and if I were on the side of Leaf, Lit Leaf Green, I would probably be looking for some forts and some keeps right now. Yeah, especially with Sylvanas. If you don't push with her, you're just, you're really not taking advantage of what she offers. You know, this is both of these teams' first game in Chair League, and I will say I really like um, what Lit Leaf Green is trying to do. 
Um, the team chemistry isn't quite there yet, but you can see what they're trying to do. And if they start lining up some of these ultis a little bit better and improving their communication on these gusts a little bit better, um, the idea is there and you, you can see what they're trying to do. It looks good. It does. You know, they have the tools to be able to turn this around on uh, a painfully average really easily here. Uh, there is no money involved in Chair League. It is like slow pitch softball. We compete for the Chair League Championship t shirt. And now it may not be money and it may not be gear, but that is a highly coveted gray Chair League t shirt, Skizzers. I know I want one. I want one as well. We're going to have these shrines being split here. Lit's going to take the bottom and. Painfully Average is going to take the top, and they might meet in the middle here. Lit is positioning there in that blind spot, trying to catch, catch him on rotation. rotation. Yeah, Skizzers, if you're not familiar with Chair League, go to chairleague.com. It's an awesome uh, community, like a sub-community of heroes. Um, it's a recreational league. It's a lot of fun. This is my third season playing in Chair League, my second season casting. Um, you can cast if you don't want to play. Anybody can cast. You just got to go sign up. It's really a blast. And um, I've made so many friends through Chair League competing against them. So I uh, highly recommend you check it out if you're not familiar with what Chair League is. All the while you were talking there, we had both teams trying to position to catch rotations. It was kind of an exciting standoff. Absolutely nothing happening. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you saw it, but I saw a little tumbleweed fly between both teams during that standoff. <laughs> And now they're just Ooh, it going... looks like Lit Leaf Green is going to want to rotate up and take the top shrine. Yep, they, and they're going to trade shrines. So now Lit Leaf Green takes the top, Painfully Average takes the bottom. And, uh, you know, if I'm Painfully Average, I think I try to get 20 here. They, they, they are definitely on pace to reach it first. And you know what's going to happen? These two teams are going to blunder into each other here in a minute. This is going to be a... There it is. Here comes the Muradin, the Rune, There's the, the Power Rune. Slide, the Sunder, the Divine Mosh Pit. Oh, he gusted him out of the Divine Mosh Pit. That's the execution we were talking about. The idea was there, but the communication wasn't, even you despite... Know, it didn't actually end up even mattering. The Kerrigan went to a wall and ended up staying there in the Mosh Pit. Yeah, but, I mean, that could have been a four- or five-man wipe instead of just two. Even still, a great team fight for uh, Litleaf Green there. And... I, I mean, painfully average has to pull back here because they're going to lose this battle five on three if they continue to push Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Falstad flew bottom to get that bottom shrine, and now we're going to have, uh, looks like, the uh, thrall here in the uh, uh, Dragon Knight. Now, you know what I would like to see them do here? Earlier in the game, they took out that bottom keep wall. They have Sylvanas. I want them to go get that bottom keep. It's right there Just for the taking. Go bottom yeah, and get that keep. As hard as you can. The wall is already down. That's just puts extra work on the Dragon Knight in mid here. Hey, Skizzers, we appreciate it. And uh, a little inside notice, this is our first night casting together, so that's good to hear that we're doing okay. This is my second game ever, so thanks for the compliment. Litleaf Green is going to get a keep here, um, and now they still have time. 42 seconds left on that DK. If... Oh, the, there's the Kerrigan, the Gust, to maybe save ETC. Do they do they save him? The and he does. Major almost got him. That one that didn't get gusted almost. Oh, there's the double combo, and they do get the ETC. There's the Sundering for the Disengage. The out to save him, the Wind Fury to get him away. There, that should get everybody away. A four-man arrow. Oh, Falstad, no! Falstad gets picked by the Q, and then Falstad gets picked. Kerrigan goes down, Thrall goes down, Uther probably going to go Kerrigan down, just gonna keep on going. and Sylvan, oh, the D-Shield, will he get away anyway? Oh, it's going to be so close, I don't think he is. Sylvanas is the last woman standing, and now they're going to finish off that keep. That they wanted so long ago. Yeah, that was uh, a little bit of a clunky engagement on both sides, but uh, turned into a bloodbath, and I think that ended up being a 3 for 3, or a 4 for 3. You know, it was, uh, I believe it was a uh, 4 for 3 after all, but this is really going to put everything on the side of uh, uh, Painfully Average here. They're going to be able to take these camps back and really get control of the lanes that you were talking about earlier in the game. Yeah, but you know, structurally and levels, look at it. We're at a dead 
heat. An absolute dead heat. Both teams at level 21, both teams with one keep down, and now both teams are going to spawn into full strength. You know, one of the team fights we saw earlier with that mosh pit, the Divine Shield coming out on that ATC, was really well executed on the side of Lit Leaf Great. We just want to see that happen again for them so that they can get at least two people yeah. to try to end the game. They've done it twice this game. The Divine Mosh has been solid. It's been the communication around what they're doing with the Gust that has been a little bit awkward. Um, but otherwise, you can tell uh, what they're trying to do with their ult synergies is really good. Chair League is only specifically for NA Heroes of the Storm Skizzers. Um, if you happen to be in EU, there is their equivalent, um, inspired by Chair League, which is Heroes Lounge, which is basically the same thing as Chair League, but for EU. It looks like they're going to trade shrines here. Again. It's going to take the top, and uh, Painfully Average is going to take the bottom. False stats staying in bottom as well to defend against those. Uh, 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 camps that were taken on the side of Painfully Average, and, and that's going to help. This is an interesting decision. You, it looked like Painfully Average was considering to going after this wall, but now they're kind of indecisive. You wonder, what is it that they're trying to do here? They think they're waiting for the wave. Um, a little bit of nothing going on. Yeah, they might want to be showing down here in bottom just the Lee Meek so that, you know, uh, Lit Leaf Green thinks, oh, we can rotate on him, and then that's when everything gets turned around on him. And unfortunately, Leaf, Lit Leaf Green does have the level lead here by just a little just bit. Just a hair, yeah. You know, once you get post 20, and uh, the the level, oh, Falstad's in trouble here. Great barrel roll to get himself out of trouble, and a the great sundering. wailing arrow, and a sundering with the Divine Mosh Pit, and the Gust to save Thrall. He's going to save Thrall by the skin of his you know, the hero of that battle is Muradin, because he stood in the middle of all that and just did Muradin. He just didn't die. Now the Leeming resets and painfully average. Just turn that right around. Falstad Q is doing work on the disengage, though. That thing does so much damage. Look at that. Thrall can't even do anything here. He had to uh, hearth back. And it looks like that was a pretty even fight. But if you look here at the top lane, we're going to see a strong siege camp on the side of Lit Leaf Green. Yeah, you know, initially it looked like Lit Leaf Green that that was going to be like an almost game decisive type of team fight. But they just weren't able to finish it. And Muradin just stood in the middle of all of that and ignored everything. They are going to trade Shrines yet again. Lit is going to take the bottom and Painfully Average is going to take the top. They have to rotate over there to clear that uh, huge wave and try to keep their keep alive here. You know, this game has been a really fun game to watch and cast kind of, you know, plot twists all throughout. And what it's going to come down to, one of these teams is going to have a decisive team fight or get the Dragon Knight and that's going to end it. I mean, it's really going to come down to one decisive moment. Yeah, this game is coming down to the wire here. It really does make you think about the micro game here and how these two teams need to have that coordination that you're speaking of in order to do that. Turn a team fight and or get the Dragon Knight. I'm really concerned about Falstad's positioning here. He's a little too far in front of his tank there for my liking. Again, we're going to have a strong push down here in the bottom lane for Lit Leaf Green. Yep. If, if That's going to have to make painfully average. Rotate away, yeah. Another. If I'm Lit Leaf Green, I'm kind of hanging back and waiting for them to respond. Oh, they're setting a party bush on the rotation. Something fun is going to happen here. Muradin gets caught. He pops Avatar. There's the Sundering. The Wailing Arrow only gets two. The Mosh Pit gets two, but immediately interrupted. Muradin is very low. Kerrigan pops her Maelstrom and is immediately gusted away. And once again, a five on five is going to be indecisive, or is it? Uther Divine Shields himself. He's trying to walk away, but he's getting body blocked by Thrall. Now we have a running five on five skirmish with five melee characters. That plays into Lit Leaf Green's favor, these kind of running skirmishes. Oh no, it looks like uh, Thrall's gonna get rooted here, and the Vulnerable comes out on the boat. Oh, and there's the reset. There Those may, that may be decisive. You know, if you can keep Leeming from getting her resets, she loses value, but... And they're looking for it. Nope, they're no. gonna take down, it looks like. They wanna have that Dragon Knight, and or they're gonna have to respond to their core. We've got Siege Giants down there in the bottom lane. Falstad is gonna be the key here. If he goes top right now, he can stop him. There he goes. There he goes. 
and he's going to prevent them from... Close. And you also have Giants and a Catapult Wave on the core for, for Red Team, pushing on to painfully average's core right now. This is a 5-on-3. Is there a Gust there for the Disengage? I wonder... Oh, there it is! It was late, though! It was late, and Sylvanas got picked off. Painfully average needs to disengage once again. You know, good on the side of... And there's Falstad with the epic mount. He's going to save the DK for Lit Leaf Green again. You know, I asked you right when the draft started, what do you want? And you said, without hesitation, instantaneously, I want Falstad. And this is why. And that is why. The epic mount at 20 allows you to just be everywhere on the map all at one time. And there's nothing you can do to stop him. Yeah, and Lit Leaf Green doesn't need to stay here. They just need to leave again. They can leave and wait for the 5-on-5. Five five. And look, there's Falstad going top. One, oh, no, he's going mid. I thought he was going to go top. Thrall is he's on his way to, to top. The rotation to delay there in the mid while Thrall goes top. Yeah, he, Falstad doesn't need to be there anymore. He needs to get out so he's not picked because Thrall has that secured. Still got 10 seconds until his gust is up to save himself. This has been a really fun game, man. This has been very exciting for sure. I like that both teams... Are, have kind of learned each other's strategies here throughout the game. We've kind of seen a progression here of both of these teams getting smarter about how they're choosing to engage. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, painfully average, uh, I think, learn to respect all the, the... Oh, Gus, to keep him alive! Wow! That was kind of an awkward place for him to fly to. Oh, they got the DK, but they got the Divine Mosh as a counter, so they're not going to be able to finish with it! They're able to pick up Zul and Kerrigan. Now it's going to be interesting to see what Le Leaf Green does here. The Li Ming is in the Dragon Knight, and they need to take that down so that they can get another kill. Yeah, and, and he's being a little bit indecisive with the DK right now. Now they seem he's to be pushing forward a bit. Seconds. Thank you for the suggestion, Skizzers. I appreciate it, actually. So uh, th that Divine Mosh Pit may have saved the game for Lit Leaf Green because now you have a 5 on 3, and I don't think they're going to get much out of this Dragon Knight. It's going to do a little bit, but not too much. And now she they might get Leeming. The just a little too late there. It looked like she did right at the end what she had wanted to do from the beginning. I think they're going to get Leeming right here. Yeah, there's the, there's the offensive there's gust into the, the 5 on gust. 3. Here goes the Rhaegar, and they're going to try to convert this back onto the Muradin as well. They are looking for kills here. They are looking to end the game as any way that they can. They might be able to end it now with... Oh, no, just Kerrigan and Zul just spawned, so they wouldn't have been able to end. But uh, this, once again, this game keeps on going. This is the game that never ends. <laughs> It looks like we're going to have a little bit of an advantage here on the side of Let Leaf Green. They do, they are up on keeps, and now they're going to try to take control of these lanes at the same time. You know, ever since those minion changes, the uh, the minions are such a huge part of what's going on, and you just can't ignore them. So two lanes of catapult spawning for only one is a big deal. Well, actually, though, with both middle keeps going, those catapults will kind of cancel each other out, so it's really only one lane. But that also means that zero lanes for Lit Leaf Green to monitor as well. Exactly. Um, for the viewers, hang around after the game. I'm going to try to get uh, the team captains in for some post-game interviews because this would be a fun game to talk about. Now, this looks like a fight that Lit Leaf Green wants to take here. Doesn't look like Painfully Average is going to let him. Now, with Rhaegar still not there yet, they're waiting for their healer to come, and, and then you're going to have your 5-on-5 five five here. That's an odd... They're just going to back up, and Muradin may have wasted his avatar. They're going to try to waste that avatar. They're going to try to wait it out. They knew that they had the space to get away from him, and he couldn't even jump in on them if he wanted to. Yeah, that was a really good decision by Lit Leaf Green to just, once that avatar popped, just to disengage and make him waste it. That was a wasted ult by Muradin, unfortunately. It was just kind of an awkward time for that to go pop. I assume he thought there would be a hard engage, but there just wasn't. He wanted to look for it. Falstad. Ooh, Falstad might be in trouble. His team needs to get here very quickly. No, don't stay, Falstad. You'll... Wow. Wow. Good barrel roll to dodge. And now Rhaegar might be in trouble. There's the Sundering. It only hits Kerrigan. And the Wailing Arrow only hits Kerrigan. But Muradin and Zul not here. And they will be able to push them off and save the DK one more time. That was a little scary there if you were on the side of Painfully Average. Having only three people up there while the five of them 
we're really putting some pressure on it. Looks like Lit Leaf oh. Green is going to want to rotate Oh, here. they had Zul! They had Zul and they rotated away! And it looks like... Oh, the Divine Shield saved it, and they got the DK. This is going to be the game. Painfully Average needs to just march straight to core, and this will absolutely end the game. This is what we were talking about earlier. This map forces you to split up, and right there, Painfully Average knew that. Lit Leaf Green stayed together as a five-man and gave up that DK. You know what? You're going to have to burn this. They burned it down fast, fast, and the Gust, and the core still standing. Can they make an epic defense here? Nope, there goes Falstad. There's Uther down. And there's the core. Wow. That's gonna be a GG. That was a fun, fun game. Hang out guys, we're gonna talk about this game a little bit and I'm gonna see if I can get these team captains into our Discord for a post-game interview because this is the game that you want to interview in. What a fantastic game to cast. That was really, really exciting. Why don't you take a look at these uh, stats here and see if anything jumps out at you, Mitchell. That Li Ming did so much work for these guys. It is a very rare, rare when you see an assassin totally outclass a specialist in terms of siege damage, having about 50% more damage here than the Zul. Not only that, she was the hero damage leader for the entire game by over 30,000 damage. And it looks like the Muradin on the side of Painfully Average was the top kills here. And that says something. You really want your Muradin to be aggressive. You want your Muradin to be getting in there. And with, you know, the new Muradin build, as they call it, uh, with the give him the axe that he did take at 16, he could output some serious damage and finish those kills off that start with the Li Ming and the Kerrigan burst. We're seeing pretty average builds for a lot of these characters here. Yeah, kind of standard builds. You know, Thrall took the reduced cooldown on the Wind Fury at four, uh, sorry, at seven, instead of the follow through. So he lost a little bit of damage there that he could have taken. Uh, I wonder if he was maybe counting on the Falstad and the Sylvanas uh, able to kind of take over that damage for him. And in another case, maybe he just wanted to get, be able to get away as, as much as possible. And you know, the Wind Fury did help him get out of a couple of hairy situations. Do me a favor, Mitchell. I'm having, for some reason, Discord is not cooperating with me. See if you can get the uh, Discord link to send these guys the uh, the invite here. Let's see. Yeah, you're, you're right, Skiz. There's a lot of that damage on Li Ming was, was her being in the DK, of course. But anytime you have a 31-minute game like this that was so back and forth, I mean, 18 kills to 14 kills, these numbers are just so huge. Um, and 108,000 hero damage on Li Ming is, is excellent, of course. This was a really, really fun game, and uh, it looks like we're going to get Brew and Scrog uh, from Painfully Average in here, the winning team. So, uh, Go ahead and whisper them right now. Okay, so uh, Brew and Scrog is who we're going to get here, Mitchell. And then after this little interview here, uh, we should be able to get uh, J-Rad from uh, Lit Leaf Green as well. So I'll go ahead and put the talent builds up on the screen so those of you watching, if they're interested. Um, like I said, pretty pretty standard stuff here. Uh, Muradin, this is kind of the Muradin 101 build. Uh, there's the give them the axe for all that damage. Um, Zul went with the backlash and uh, kind of the... Yeah, this is actually the build I use, except for here, the push build. Um, Li Ming went with their arcane Li Ming build. choosing to go for astral presence at one that is going to allow her to get a lot of mana regen when she is really low on mana trying to get those resets. Well, and it's so important for her to stay on the field, too, and that allows her to do that. And, you know, the cooldown reduction at 4 on the Triumphant as well is really going to be able to put out, put a lot of damage, and we can see that in the stats screen. Hey, uh, Mitchell, send, uh, whisper me that link, too, so I can send it to J-Rad when the time comes. Did, oh, you, did, sure. did you get it to them? Uh, hey guys, can y'all hear us? Yeah, we can hear. Who's this? 
Uh, this is Scrog talking. Hey, Scrog, this is Mongoose here and my buddy Mitchell. How you doing? And there's. Should be here as well. That sounds like he's there now. Yes, sir. All right. Well, uh, this is your guys' first chair league game, right? Um, I did play last season on a different team, but this is our first uh, game as a as a team here. Well, we um, a brand new crew, and we're rocking it out. That was a hell of a game. Let me tell you, we were both having a blast casting that because that was a fun. That was a really fun game. No kidding. Yes, thank you. I, it was very, very intense on our end as well. I mean, that was one that could have really gone either way right up till the end. It was really fun. It was like a movie, man. A bunch of plot twists and turns. Why don't you guys just kind of give us your um, initial impressions of that game and, and what were maybe some of the key moments in your opinion? Go ahead, sure. Drew. Uh, well, we've been working as a, a team. We have our own curse server with about 60 different people on it, but there's a core group of 10 of us or so that have been playing for a couple months now getting ready. Um, so we're used to our rotations that you saw us run. We knew how we were going to pick and put a stool top uh, and then rotate from there. And then from that point, it just kind of depends on how things are going and how well we adjust. How about the, uh, the uh, draft? Because we were commenting before the game that we actually liked both teams' drafts. Um, however, you guys had a four melee team, which is a little bit unusual. Was that something you were targeting specifically, or did it just kind of stumble into that as the draft developed? Go for it, Scott. Uh, well, <clears throat> to be completely honest with you guys, um, it was, uh, I would say, about 75% intentional. Um, we, you know, as uh, Bruce said, we've been playing together a lot, um, just doing unranked draft and team leagues and hero leagues and whatnot. And uh, we found that uh, those melee heavy comps uh, can have a lot of success when you do have a really solid backline blow up, somebody who can just throw those mad damage from the backline. And so we were hoping to get something like that. Um, yeah, you know, like we didn't necessarily like we didn't go into the game planning on that 100%, but it was kind of an idea in the back of our minds, and the draft just totally went into that. We we knew they loved their Rhaegar based on looking at some of their profiles. We laughed when they saw their profile pictures were Rhaegar, and we took a first pick on them. <laughs> yeah, um, but be because we did that, they ended up taking our Paul Sad and a couple other key players that we would normally prioritize. Paul Sad and Desire. Yeah. Um, talk about in the early part of that game, uh, Lit Leaf kind of really comboed some of their ultis well together, specifically in the early game, but really throughout. And it seems like you guys made a little bit of an adjustment to not get quite quite, quite so much in those Sunder Divine Mosh's combos. Is that something you guys talked about during the game? It's all Scrog yelling at us, telling us to not get caught in the combos. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, after we saw the draft, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing about the draft is they drafted a super strong team comp. And we wanted the ETC, uh, we wanted the Falstad, and they snagged both of those from us. So with what we were looking at, we knew that pretty much the only thing we had to stop that mosh pit was the uh, the wave of force from Ming Ming. So the, our, our only option at that point was to force the engagements on our end, make, make only take the engagements that we could, and then if we got caught in an engagement, to make sure that Ming Ming was in the back to try and knock him out of it. So, yes, they, you know, when they got those good combos on us earlier, they secured some kills. And at that point, we're just like, look, as soon as that ETC comes out, we've got to stay spread because we cannot get caught in those monsters or we're going we're gonna to lose the game. Anything from you, Mitchell? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We made it a point for everybody to know how to play all the meta heroes. So we do have a lot of flexibility going in. And we can adjust according to their draft and how to do it. Yeah, the wave of force was a great pick there, and you know, it's it was interesting when I first saw the orb build coming out from you at you know level four or seven. I was kind of questioning why you would want to go with that, but as you guys were just talking about, you wanted to stay in the back and be able to do as much damage as possible to them, which you were really really able to do. Well, and I'll tell you why I like that wave of force pick is, you know, um, <clears throat> transitioning from Hero League to competitive. This is my third season in Chair League. Um, there's a lot of things you can get away with in, in, in the kind of regular Hero League that you can't, even in low-level competitive organized play. And one of them is that Disintegrate Ming makes Li Ming stand still for a pretty long time. Oh. <laughs> and as as I play Falstad a lot, I know when Li Ming takes that Disintegrate Beam, that Q is going straight at her, and it, it does a lot of work on Li Ming. 
Oh, a full boomerang? Uh, yeah. Takes at least half a exactly yeah, right. Yeah, so that wave of force, in my opinion, was the, was the pick. Fun, guys. For casting for us. Yeah, man, uh, definitely. We're uh, casting again tomorrow if you want to watch us. We're only one of two games, chair league games, being casted tomorrow. So if you got nothing better to do, grab a pizza and watch us. Uh, great game and hang out on Twitch because we're going to interview the other team captains now. Sounds, All right, great, sounds great, guys. Appreciate it. Hey, great game, fellas. Congratulations on the win. Okay, yeah, great game, night. guys. Thank you very much. All right, now we're going to get. Where is he? Oh, where you go? We're going to get uh, J-Rad in here. That's from uh, uh, Lit Leaf Green. So while he's white, wait, while you were waiting for uh, J-Rad, anything uh, stick out to you from those two guys? They had their game plan. From the beginning, they were creating their game plan in draft, and it is something that they knew what they wanted to do, and they executed it very well. It was really smart on the side of Scrog to not only go the orb build to kind of stay away, but to also go the wave of force so that he knew he could get the ETC out of Mosh at any time. So you know what I took away from it is apparently I have to start yelling when we overextend in our game. That That's what I... Scrog was yelling at us to stay out of those, so I think I might start yelling. You know, if you've ever heard any of the audio captured from uh, any of the pro teams, uh, it is nothing but shouting and, and a little bit of cursing as well. Yeah, absolutely. They get very intense. You know, I went to uh, the Burbank Regionals because it's real close to my house, and Noventic in particular, man, those guys like scream at each other. I was like, holy moly! So it looks like J-Rad is also going to bring Raven in, so we will have two members of Lit Leaf Green in here momentarily as well. Oh, you guys are here. Great. So uh, we had Raven, of course, was on Falstad, and J-Rad was on Thrall. Uh, that's got to be a heartbreaking loss, but I'll tell you guys, that was a hell of a game and a lot of fun to cast. So well played just throughout the whole game. It really could have gone either way. Yeah, most definitely are. Team that we practiced against uh, was crushing us on that map probably in under 12 minutes. Uh, I don't think I've ever had a 30 minute game on, on Dragon Shard before. Yeah, man, and you know, when they got the DK, you guys wiped out three of them so they couldn't finish with it. It was just a plot twist after plot twist. Let's, uh, let's start back at the draft. Uh, <clears throat> Mitchell and I were both commenting after the draft before the game started um, that both teams, we thought drafted really good teams, but the thing that stuck out to us was the quadruple melee on the part of Painfully Average. Um, was that something you guys noted specifically, and, and what did you think of that, and maybe ways to counter it? Uh, with with the, the Rhaegar first pick, it was kind of, we don't know if they were, if they were trying to counter us um, based on our, our, our player history. I'm going to interrupt you, and I'll tell you, that, yes, they were trying to counter you based on your player history, because <laughs> they said as much. So carry on. Gotcha. Um, so with, with that, it was kind of like, all right, well, we have a game plan. Regardless of what they do there, we got to see where we want to go. We really wanted to bear, ban out Kerrigan to begin with. Um, I don't even recall what we banned to start, but uh, you know, we came in with this with this game plan. I uh, would have liked to have had Rhaegar, um, and uh, probably would have been better off had we gone with a mage, uh, just because of the amount of damage that Leeming put out. But you know, overall, I think we put out a pretty substantial amount of damage on them we just couldn't finish anyone well i don't know about could have finished anyone i mean kills were 18 14 so it was pretty close you guys you guys definitely did some work there um did you guys have uh, something you were targeting specifically going into the draft and and how did that draft go compared to what you were targeting um before the game started uh, you pretty much see it um we were gonna go for a really standard comp um just to to not do anything out of the out of the ordinary to start game one of our season, we're gonna we're gonna see how the season progresses and, and see how we do. Um, it's probably what we were most comfortable playing, um, and, and it really came down to just they they got a, a good DK at the end of the game, and uh, so I don't think the comp hurt us at all. No, I don't think so. And you guys were about three seconds away from capping that top and preventing him again. It was still close right at the right right up till the very end. 
Is this uh, this is your guys' uh, first season as a team in Chair League, is that correct? Yes. Uh, it, uh, a couple of us have played on other teams uh, last season. Um, but I think Raven and Tebby, uh, uh, I think, have not played on a Chair League match yet. So that was their first one. Well, that's a, so that's a pretty good game to burst onto the scene with because that, that was – I'm going to go out on a limb and say that was probably, if people watched all the Chair League games today, the most or one of the most entertaining games of the night for sure. I'll definitely go back and watch it. Yeah, man, it was it was a really fun game. It really was. <clears throat> um, I was. You'll hear me when you go back and watch in the game. I was commenting on um, you guys seem to be just not 100% on point with your combining of your ults like you could see what you were trying to do and the execution was good but not perfect um but you guys the divine mosh in particular is hard to hit and you guys landed a couple of really really nice ones were you guys working on that or just something you kind of threw together when you didn't get the Rhaegar? Um, yeah i mean it's it's kind of uh you know we've we've been together for as a team 10 days maybe a little bit more so we haven't really had a bunch of practices together so um, I mean, it is stuff that we work on, but like I said, like I said, the, the, you know, we don't have we just don't have the games together. We don't have that uh, that uh, that I don't know the keeping us together so we know what everyone else is doing. Right, uh, right, yeah. Type deal. Because, I mean, the, the the theory behind the execution was, was so good. Like, you could tell exactly what you guys were trying to do, and it was still good. But there was one fight in particular where I was like, man, that was really good, and they killed three of them. But if it would have been just a little bit better, it would have been an ace. And I was really impressed with your theory behind the execution of what you guys were trying to do. It was really on point. Yeah, I think the, the I asked the team shot caller, it, I, I left it up to everyone to, to know when to use their alts. In the draft, I would have to say that I, I'm not a huge fan of the the combination of alts, just because they, you know there was one fight where I, I almost gusted everyone out of the mosh, and you know it's it, you run a lot of risk of between um, running mosh and then having gust and sunder of just completely blowing any kind of combo you could you could have. And yeah, you know, absolutely. I actually talked about that we both did beforehand that the Divine Mosh is awesome, but it, it is a lot of eggs in one basket, so if you don't get something out of it, I mean, that's that's a lot you've just blown for not getting much, you know? Yeah, we, uh, we'll definitely be uh, thinking more about some, uh, some AOE damage in the future, but uh, see uh, see where it goes in our uh, next game next uh, next week. Uh, any, do you guys have any just kind of thoughts on the game in general or or uh, maybe key moments that you thought uh, were big in the game that you wanted to talk about? No, it was a great game. It's, uh, you know, a little thing here and there and totally different, but you know, it, was, it was fun. It was fun on my end, too. We, we were both having a blast with it. I mean, we, we were almost laughing because it was like, this game won't end. Like, they can't, neither one of these teams can put the other one away. Um, and uh, finally, it was, to, and you know what, even when they got that d game ending DK, it was so close. You guys were so close to pushing them off the top there, too. Yeah, it, needed, it came down to needing to make a big play. Um, and the person needing to make that big play with Gus, I kind of feel like you know, I, uh, I got to be a little bit less passive in the future. But, well, uh, that was a hell of an intro to Chair League game. You know, sometimes these placement games, you don't quite know what you're going to get. Um, like our first one was just an absolute nine minute stomp. So this was a nice one to, to, to follow up that one with. Um, great game, fellas. Uh, it sounds like Mitchell and I might be casting another one we just kind of stumbled into. So hang out if you want to see some more games. Uh, we're also casting tomorrow at seven, uh, North versus Sweet Synergy, which is an all female Heroes of the Storm team. Um, so they're fun. And uh, great game, fellas. And uh, invite me anytime you want us to cast. We'll do it if the schedule allows. Good. Thanks for having us. It is actually fielding four teams, so I'm sure you'll cast for at least each of us at least once this season. Oh, there you go. That sounds fun, guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm going to respond to some of the chat here. Uh, 80171. Um, go on to Chair League, uh, click Manage Your Match, and click Invite Caster. Find me and click Invite. Uh, if your game is at 9, which is in about five minutes, uh, we will definitely cast you. 
Um, and uh, my uh, battle net, if you want to whisper me, is mongoose uh, pound 1844, I think. Yeah, 1844. Uh, Any other questions? Posturing most of the game. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Skizzers, man, definitely check it out. All you got to do to be a caster is just tell him you want to be. Um, this season, he started a thing where casters have to actually qualify to cast the higher division game so you'll start casting placement in division three which is fine because there's so many games down there and then i maybe 10 games or 15 you go to division two and then on and up great so it uh, looks like we might have another game i'm going to take us off air here for about five minutes maybe even less just so i can uh, reset some of the stream settings and get us ready for our next game oh vods yes uh, VODs all will be posted um, on my Twitch stream when the chair, uh, when we, the broadcast has ended. It'll stay there for two weeks, and I always post uh, my games on YouTube. Um, if you go on to twitch.tv slash mongoose underscore 22, there's a link to my YouTube page where you can find all of the games uh, that I've casted. So uh, we're going to be off air for just a couple minutes here. We'll be back momentarily, hang out, and we'll have our last game of the night.
All right. Well, obviously Mitchell <laughs> is away momentarily. Uh, he shall return to us. Uh, we are getting a last minute a uh, last minute cast here, kind of putting together at the last minute. It's going to be who let Vince play versus West Coast Express. Oh, hold on, we may have a Safu here. Nope, could not. Sorry about that. I had to deal with some cats on it. You get you back now. Good. Okay, let's get you in here. Oh yeah, I'm great. Yeah, I'm I'm ready to go. Well, uh, we're not officially, officially casting it because we didn't get the game until uh, uh, after the start time. So as far as Chair League is concerned, this is an uncasted game, but we're going to get it going anyway. So we have uh, home team is... Uh, see, we're, I'm not, normally I have my homework done, but this was put together in like five minutes. Yeah, no problem, guys. I'm glad you guys invited me. Home team is West Coast Express, and who let Vince play... Uh, will be the away team, and they will have the map selection. And our map will be uh, Cursed Hollow, an excellent map, one of my favorites. Kind of the default map when you think about yeah. this game. Yeah, kind of the uh, more prototypical kind of MOBA-ish map in Heroes of the Storm. And, very uh, large, very... <clears throat> If I'm not mistaken, uh, Who Let Vince Play is the team that tried to qualify for NA Regionals um, on the online tournaments. Uh, so these guys should be pretty good. I even remember um, in one of the Beyond the Nexuses, Dredd was talking about them a little bit. They kind of snuck up on people, won a couple games, and uh, let them take notice, and now here they are in Share League. That's going to be pretty exciting, man. Yeah, it should be. I was actually... Uh, me and a couple other people were lobbying to Jova to just put them straight into the pro division because they obviously prove they can hang with some really good teams. But uh, here they are in placement anyway. Uh, should be fun. Should be fun. Uh, which actually works out well for us. Well, it doesn't matter because it's an unofficial cast. I say it works out well for us because if it was a pro game, technically we couldn't cast it. But since we're rogue, yeah. we're rogue casters now, it doesn't really matter what division they're in. We take the matches when we can. That's right. So let's start talking about Cursed Hollow now that we have officially going. West Coast Express has first ban. Cigar Falstad, really solid on this map. Brightwing, of course, because it's such a large uh, map. Yeah, we talked about those globals last game. Those globals are going to really help in this game as well. The size of the map means that being able to get to those tributes when they pop up before the other team is really, really useful. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, this is um, different. Uh, the globals are, are important on this map for a different reason. Um, just because the map is so big. I mean, like Dragonshire is smaller than this one. This one, the size is so big and the tributes are all over the place. You really get globals out of it. And another another thing to always consider on Cursed Hollow is it's Abathur's best map. This is the map you're most likely to see him on. Absolutely. That Abathur is such a surprise pick for most teams. A lot of people don't know how to deal with it afterwards. Yeah. And, and he can snowball this map very, very well. Yeah, he can split soak on the other side of the map when the objective is there, and he can also lay those slowing mines to delay the rotation. So we're into the map, West Coast Express, first bans Grey Main, who let Vince play responds with the Thrall ban. I would be surprised if we didn't see a Zagara or a uh, Falstad here. 
you gotta wonder if either one of those picks, sorry, bands, are gonna be targeted at the other team. You gotta wonder if maybe these guys have done their homework. Maybe, and there's the Zagara first pick. That's not surprising. Uh, I'm totally Miles. This is a top drafter. Uh, Jova uses it because it's integrated into the Cherry League website, so that way um, all of these drafts, uh, when they're official, are recorded um, to the team's profile, so you can check out what teams are drafting. So top drafter is integrated into Cherry League. Um, that's why Jova uses it. There's the Falstad pick. No surprise. What are we going to see here, Mitchell? You know, we're probably going to see another assassin come up to try and follow up with a false dead. Last game we saw false dead thrall. That's not going to be an option this game. And just like we were talking about earlier, just like you said, our first pick was Zagara, second pick was false dead. So ETC is going to be the second pickup for who let bits play. Not a bad pick early in the draft. Counterable? Yes, absolutely. They already have one counter on the side of West Coast Express in the form of the Maw. But you want to be able to take that away from the other team as soon as possible. The Cursed Hollow, some of these curses that come up, some of the tributes, have very small areas around them. And if you're able to get off a mosh pit as ETC, that can turn around the game. Yeah, and you know, we talked about global. ETC can be global. You don't see it much, uh, but he can be a global hero if he goes stage dive. It's just kind of something that you can float around in the back of your head. And Brightwing is picked up. That's going to be West Coast Express's global presence. If they go uh, Nidus Network with Zagara, that gives them two. Um, technically, we could have four global heroes already selected here if, you, uh, if they talent these heroes correctly. <laughs> Lee Ming pickup here is going to round out the, the second pick here for West Coast Express. Not a bad choice on this map either. She's really able to delay those tributes with serious poke damage. Yeah, not only that is well, one she's just always solid. But uh, there's a lot of you know narrow fighting corridors around the tributes, and her arcane orb can be pretty hard to dodge sometimes in those small corridors in the middle of a fight. Those orbs can get pretty nasty if she takes the cooldown reduction at four. There are just orbs upon orbs flying everywhere. Now we have Who Let Vince Play, uh, their second ban. Um, I would imagine a tank would be my guess. Maybe Muradin. Muradin's just so good. He's always good in any comp, in any map, any time. Um, I wouldn't surprise me to see Muradin. Although Tyrael, with his sanctification in those narrow corridors... Oh, Tychus. So maybe they're thinking double tank comp and they want to ban that Tychus out. There's definitely something going on there with that Tychus pick. You know, Tychus is a strong hero on his own, regardless of if the other team has double tanks or not. So maybe they just don't didn't want to deal with it at this point. Yeah. You gotta wonder, maybe, are they trying to run Cho'Gal? Yeah, I, I don't think that's as likely on a large three-lane map. Tychus has just really been ascending in the meta right now, generally. So I, I would guess you're going to see double frontliner, and they just didn't want to see him. And then you have the Uther ban. We just saw how good Divine Mosh Pit could be last game. And there's the Uther ban, keeping him away from ETC. Very smart ban on the side of West Coast Express. They also, you know, West Coast Express already has their support. They want to lower that support pool on the side of who let Vince play to kind of force them to take a Rhaegar, which is exactly what they pick up right here. You know, but I'm okay with being forced to take a Rhaegar pretty much any time. He's, he's good. You know who isn't? <laughs> That Ancestral is just is so clutch, and he's got good wave clear uh, for a support. Um, he's got the, uh, if they do take some kind of damage frontliner here, that Lightning Shield uh, is always good. Oh, uh, Mitchell, we have feedback. You're coming in a little bit quiet again. Maybe we can turn you up a bit. Or move your mic. Oh, Lunara. That's that's a good, good pick. Lunara has really serious poke damage. testing it out now miles let me know how that sounds the lunara is going to be another good pick here as well talk about poke damage she's got it in spades yeah for sure um and that that lends me to even more thought that their next pick is going to be a frontline hero um to keep the false dead and lunara safe because the two of those characters provide really all the damage that you need so uh <clears throat> i think you're going to see a frontliner coming out of who let vince play West Coast Express, they're going to pick a tank here, and then um, you wonder after that. Sylvanas is still on the board. This is not one of her prioritized maps because there's nothing she can really push with, except for, of course, the two bosses. 
And there's Muradin, the always good in any comp on any map tank. And Raynor, maybe in anticipation of a second um, frontliner like you and I are anticipating, maybe they're anticipating it as well and took that Raynor for that reason. There's a lot of sustained damage on Raynor. His giant killer is also going to be able to melt down that ETC and whatever other frontliner they choose, be it a tank with a large health pool. This is a pretty kind of standard comp, uh, although only one frontliner from West Coast Express with four ranged characters. If who let Vince play? Uh, I'll, I'll check that. I think I already turned him up all the way, though, Dixor. Is everybody hearing uh, Mitchell quiet? Let us know. Um, you might want to go in and turn the output settings just in general. Or Tannis. There's the, there's the second frontliner. That's our, exactly what we were talking about. Let's see here. Oh, that's not you. Here we go. Uh, see, I've got you all the way up. Um, oh, you know what? If you go into the user settings and then go into voice, you can change the uh, output volume Server as well. Server settings. Sorry, guys, that we're doing this while we're on here. We just want you to hear. Are you still there? Did I close you? No, me? I'm still here. I oh, should be here. good. Yeah, I thought I closed... Uh, <laughs> I thought I closed it. All right, hold on. We're, we're going to get this dialed in, guys. This is, uh, I'm not going to lie, technically speaking, um, has not been our most technically savvy cast. It's down um, It's down by your name there at the bottom. Okay, one, sorry, hold on one second here. We're yeah. gonna, one thing at a time, one thing at a time. And well, West Coast Express, right? That's this team? Okay. Okay, perfect. Let me let them know that we are ready to rock and roll. And while we're doing that, all right. Sorry, guys. We're we're we will get this dialed in. Okay. What I wanted, not server settings. Okay, where's oh, right here, user settings. Perfect, yeah, user settings. Voice there. output volume. Okay, guys, let me know how that sounds. Yeah, I'm gonna try this one more time. Hopefully, that solves everything. I think that'll do it. My mic's turned up pretty high. I'm, I'm imagining I'm turned up high in Discord for you, so yeah, I let, let us know, guys. I think that should solve it. Okay, so West Coast Express, we have Twang on Muradin, Paratrooper on Zagara. Kilo Whiskey on Leeming, Frosty on Raynor, and Terralian on Brightwing. On the side of who let Vince play, we're going to have BO171 on the ETC. We're going to have Dirt Boy Dev on Lunara, Bubble 07 on Falstead, Interconnect on Artanis, and Totally Miles on the Rhaegar. <clears throat> And Twitch, if this is your first game with us, I'm aware my observer is a little wonky. We will have it fixed before tomorrow's cast. Like I said, this has not been, uh, technically speaking, our uh, <laughs> my best cast. But it is opening week of Chairling, so we're we're working out the kinks, and that will be fixed tomorrow. I will have the best interface free downloaded available uh, we can find tomorrow. Responding to somebody in the chat, you, Artanis is definitely an interesting pick here, but you gotta imagine that he wants a blind for his ult for that Raynor, uh, for the Zagara, and for the Muradin as well. He can stop a lot of damage coming out if he can get that blind off on a lot of people. Yeah, and if played properly, he is just a pain to bring down. Um, he just goes and goes and goes. Of course, the weakness with Artanis is you have to select your engagements really carefully because he has no way of disengaging. Once he is That's, in, he's in. He's in. He doesn't get out very easily. You have to stay and stick around to really get use of his trait and everything that that comes with it. Okay, looks like we're going to have maybe a little skirmish here. There's Artanis. And there's a little three-on-three -three brewing. Frosty uh, had his E proc to heal himself, but he's not going to get away. Brightwing is in trouble too, but Brightwing and Muradin both get away, and Raynor gets picked off. The swap from Artanis into the three-man body block, very smartly played here by Vince Play. So uh, <clears throat> Artanis getting a little low, but one of the things about Artanis, he's never low. <laughs> he likes playing at half health. That's what he does. That's kind of his comfort zone. Now we have Zagara, 
ETC, where is the girl? She was, she left. Where the heck is she? I saw, I assumed she was down here because of her creep, but turns out she's not here. But we have a three-man push on the bottom. Oh, there's Zagara, wrong team. Just to deal with Zagara, she's so good in solo lane that Who Let Vince Play sent three members to shove her back and make sure she didn't come out. That's a long power slide. coming out from Who Let Vince Play is really doing them well. They're able to kind of bully these lanes here that they want to be in and get people shoved back that they don't want to be foot forward. Yep, and, and they they know how much of a bully Zagara is. They're not letting her get any mileage at all, keeping Lunara and ETC both down there. We are getting to the two-minute mark, so you're going to see the Merc spawn now, uh, or shortly. There they are. And let's see if they rotate to Mercs. Kind of the traditional way of playing this is each team would rotate to their Giants, and you've got a 50-50 shot of pressure in the opposite lane when the first tribute spawns. Zagara might be in trouble. There's the power slide followed by the face melt and the poison damage from Lunara picks off Zagara. And that timing could not have been worse for painfully or for a West Coast a Express. Magnificent pick here on the side of Let Vince play. They wanted to have the advantage here for this first tribute. They also go over and get the site as well, giving yeah. them that rotation site. And West Coast Express is going to say, you know what? We don't even care. Go ahead and have it. We need to catch up. Yeah, that's the right call because they can't contest it 5v4. Um, so that was the right play. Ha keep everybody in lane. And, and it helped them catch up in experience. You know, they're about a half a level down instead of three quarters levels. What an aggressive play, sending Artanis and Rhaegar to steal West Coast Express's giant camp. This is a very aggressive call. And this is something I honestly, this is amazing. I love seeing this. Aggressive plays like this are really what make games like this on this map. And they knew that they had the sight. They had every tool that they needed in their disposal to be able to back out of there and or defend if they needed to. And it was a really, really good move here on who let Vince play. Yep, not only that, they had vision on everybody, so they knew it was safe. West Coast Express didn't have any idea what was going on, and they sent the two best characters in Rhaegar and Artanis to do that. Muradin almost gets picked off, but he is Muradin, so that's a pretty tough nut to crack. I'm surprised to see them trying to go for that Muradin pickoff, but they almost got it. They almost got it. Raynor was forced to go deal with the Giants, keeping him out of lane, but he is now rejoining his teammates. This is uh, a. Like Zagara is getting some really good value there in bottom. She's able to get that uh, uh, tower down there to try to catch up here with Who Let Vince Play. She is, and Who Let Vince Play, they are going to get Raynor, and that's going to allow them a 7 versus 6 talent to your advantage. They're going to get tribute number 2, and they're going to get it uncontested once again. This time, Falstad, they didn't even need to, he didn't even come down for it. Muradin and Li Ming, this is a very. A very questionable decision. Rhaegar is pretty low, but I don't think they're going to be able to get him. This is this has got to be why they chose that Artanis in the first place. And look at this Those background swans. duel of Li Ming and Lunara. <laughs> you almost caught me there. Lunara's going to get. She's going to get caught. Man. She's going to. They don't see her. No, oh, the storm bolt storm was a half a second oh, late. A half a second wow. late. I thought for sure they would get here. The leaning player has to be telling them she's right there. Wow. The standing still jukes by Lunara. The best jukes are none at all. <laughs> Apparently so. Stand in the bush and rely on your Bambi camouflage. So here is an early rotation here by West Coast Express, and which they need to do. Is going to be a little bit behind. I think who let Vin? Oh, I was going to say they might just stay in lane and soak to ten because they don't need this. Now it's a five on four. Etc is down at the bottom. Artanis is really low, and this is what we we're talking about. He doesn't have a great way of disengaging. He's literally just walking away. Looks like. Who let Vince play is just trying to really delay this as much as possible to get a e lot of value out of that push. And out of that, yeah, ETC split so. With those two siege giants, he, he's going to be able to do some work. And we do have a pause because we had a disconnect. Uh, so hopefully we'll iron this out. This does happen from time to time. It looks like the uh, Zagara player was DC'd.
Oops, that's not what I wanted. So, uh, okay, well, it looks like we had a computer crash. That's so probably going to take him a minute or two to get back going. In the meantime, let's check out these builds. We got Muradin. This is Muradin 101. <laughs> it's the, uh, the build. Zagara went with the Infest at level 1. You do have a couple of options there. That's the one that buffs the ranged minions. Uh, on this map, if that, that leads me to believe he's going to go Nidus um, because that really helps his split push. And uh, same thing with the Medusa Blades. So uh, I think you're going to see a Nidus network here from Zagara, which on this large map is, is, is always good. I'm going to have a Calamity build from uh, Li Ming. Of course, Rainer going his, this is very standard Rainer 101. Yeah, you know, a little bit of an odd choice there at four. Leeming decided she wanted to go with the Triumvirate to get that cooldown on the uh, orb there, but then she wants to go with the Calamity to be able to finish people off at the end. Interesting that you don't see her go for the Dominate at four in order to get her healing up after she gets those takedowns yeah, maybe, as well. Yeah, maybe what the thought is is that on this map in particular, she's going to be poking at long range a lot, so you may as well reduce the cooldown. Absolutely. ETC, this is a kind of standard ETC as well. Uh, Lunara goes Crippling Spores uh, for a little more wave clear. Uh, Nimble Wisp is pretty standard. And she didn't go with the... Um, what am, what's the... What am I... The Mercenary Damage. Why, why can't I think of what it's called? Mitchell, help me. Oh, the Nature's Culling. Did not, go, na seven. Did not go Nature's Culling, went Splintered Spear instead. Which... She wants to be able to spread her spear around. This is part of what gives her such good poke, is that splintered spear. She's not only able to put out the Noxious Blossom right there, boom, that's a delay, and then you get another delay on the splintered spear as well. So I can definitely see why maybe that was a choice. The only thing I'd say is it generally works better with teams that are a little more melee heavy. With only one melee character, um, it might be a little tougher to get back uh, to the back line with it. Okay, we're counting down, and we are resuming. West Coast Express, they will finally get this uh, channel, and uh, <clears throat> who let Vince play, just stalled and got the split soak, and they're starting the boss. A very aggressive call. They're doing it right under their nose, right as they disengaged, and it's only Rhaegar and Artanis right now. Here comes uh, Lunara. They got 10 first. They're going to get the boss. This is going to put them in a really commanding position as soon as this third tribute spawns. And they know that the next tribute that comes up, they want to have it. It wants to be on their side, and so they're going to get the boss in order to secure that for them. I love to see that aggressive boss play like that on this map. And they're the earlier the boss, the better. They're going to push with it with their 10s. Leeming is going to get picked off, and they're going to push with the boss. West Coast Express had no idea. They didn't respond with their boss of their own. Mitchell, why don't you hit the ultimates since my... Uh... Observer interfaces Absolutely. on the today. side of uh, West Coast Express here. We've got ancestral. No, that's weird. My uh, interface is messed up as well. Oh wow. <laughs> We're gonna have Mosh Pit come out for the ETC. Leaping Strike for Lunara. Mighty Gust for False Dad. Purifier Beam for Artanis. And Ancestral Healing for the Rhaegar. He went with the Purifier Beam instead of the. Uh... It's a very interesting pick for sure, but you know, you want to be able to get that Rainer or that Li Ming out of the fight as soon as possible. The Purifier Beam really helps to keep them out, and if they can't stick near that Bright Wing, it's going to do a lot of damage to them. Well, now we are also going to see who let Vince play go for this. The, go for the boss before, before the tribute. Well, because they know three members are in the top lane, them. but they're taking a lot of damage from that Zagara poke. This is a crazy aggressive move, especially with the... ETC oh, there's the Purifier Beam melts be Zagara. The Ancestral is going to come out on ETC to save him there. They're going to let this boss get really low, and they're going to have to fight for it. They can't give it up at this point. The Rhaegar goes in on the Rainer. West Coast Express has down. to retreat. They, they, they can't stay here. That is a double boss on the side of who let Vince play. With the tribute. And they are going to be able and the to get curse. curse here. Wow. You've got to wonder what's going on on the side of West Coast, uh, West Coast Express. 
Well, I mean, I think part of it's got to be these the, the shot calling on who let Vince play is really aggressive, and it's if it's not something you were expecting, it's an adjustment you have to make. Most teams aren't going to make that call to get the boss right then. Um, so it's a really aggressive they call. They're going to want to wait until you typically you wait until the end of a curse to get boss. Look Frosty how fast Rainer just stunned. melted. Wow. Just you know, I will say that Purifier Beam is going to go good with the Mosh Pit and the Lunara stuns and the Wind Slows, or the Lunara Slows and the Wind Slows. So they have a lot of abilities that slow their opponents, which will keep that Purifier Beam on them for maximum damage. Wow, the ETC going in there is trying to stun everybody so that they can get the first keep. <clears throat> he even gave up his life so that they could do it. This boss is still up at around almost 75% health, but they're going to back off here. You know, it's interesting to watch the Artanis play here. He went for Season Marksman right at the beginning to make him that extra bruiser that they needed in order to get a lot more damage out than they would have if he had, for example, gone amateur opponent. You know, I, I am surprised when ETC power slided in there. He looked like he had a three- or four-man mosh. I was really surprised he didn't hit it. Uh, I believe it looked like he didn't have any follow-up. And maybe he knew it wouldn't have lasted through... Oh, the, the B-stepping from Lunara. And he didn't want to waste it. And then he leaping strike the wall. This puts West Coast Express in such a hairy position here. Two keeps right now are gone, and it is ten minutes into the game. Yeah, and four, four levels down. Defense, unfortunately, for the rest of the game, you're you're basically going to have to see. Uh, West Coast Express, Express play absolutely out of their mind, and who let Vince play is going to have to make some errors. That's what it's really going to come down to, the errors you, on the side of who let Vince play. You can see ETC, He's by holding that mosh pit, he almost keeps the enemy team at bay by not using it. And there it comes out with the wave of force coming in from Li Ming. And he just gets uh, destroyed. He's going to stop it and kill him at the same time. Going you know, over the, the ults for uh, West Coast Express, your avatar is going to be the choice of Muradin. Nidus Network, you called it on the Zagra Wave of Force, of course, on the Leeming, Hyperion for Raynor, and Blink Heal for the Brightwing. You know, you got to commend West Coast Express fighting that far down in Talent Tier. That was a really good defense to drive them away. And then on the Pursuit, where they're all so low in health, although Lunara is going to, she's going to kill people with that Splintered Spear. I think they over pursued that. Is really going to be able to put a lot of damage out there but it doesn't matter the They're calamity turn it around on the artanis there wow brightwing kept them up when she came in with that poison damage and splinter spear it looked like she was going to get two or three people out of that she really did spread that around and now well, another tribute's going to come up you know who let fitz play is down it's on their side of the map lunara's going to get right. picked west coast express with an excellent lunara pick there and they're going to get this and is Hulet Vince play going to contest this three on five? You got to think like they're not the going to. There we want go. To. He wanted to, but he knew it was smarter, smarter not to. You know, the rest of this game is basically going to be a five on four because West Coast Express has to keep somebody back all the time goalkeeping for the core. You know, it looks like they want to make another aggressive call here on the side of Hulet Vince play. They are going to go up and grab their boss yet again. It just came up maybe 20 seconds ago. And why not? They have vision all over the map. There's no way West Coast Express can realistically try to get up there and challenge this because there's so much pressure on the court. <laughs> that Zagara taking the Nidus Network is a little hard now because she has to play back she has to play the goalkeeper for this team she can't get aggressive and go around and try to get her global value to try to get some of these tributes and it looks like they're going to invade on the giant camps but west coast express was able to snake it first now this is west coast express's time they're on even talent here they're only one level down this is curse point for them this is when they have to win a team fight if they're going to come back in this game but they have the boss marching down on lane they so they it's actually hard for them. they can't they even contest let this boss go because they <clears throat> is going straight look at the course. focus fire on murden beautiful on the side of who let vince play we oh. have the false dead flying in and doing an aggressive gust to try to keep damage on west coast Express. oh no out, getting two people 
Uh, Li Ming tried to come in and do a calamity on the ETC, get, ends up getting caught herself, and this might be game right here. This, I, this absolutely is game. You know, I'm going to commend West Coast Express. They fought as well as really could be expected once they were down that far, but they just got down too far too fast. It became a one-sided battle very early, and unfortunately that set up West Coast Express for the loss. Yeah, once they made that aggressive boss call that West Coast Express didn't sniff out on the verge of that tribute, that really set up the dominoes to push it down the rest of that game. Very dominant showing here by who let Vince play. Let's see if uh, maybe we can get one of these guys in here for uh, for an interview. Who we got? Let's see. Rhaegar going with a really aggressive Ghost Wolf build here, it looks like. Pharaoh Heart at four, Blood and Thunder at seven. Hunger of the Wolf at 16. Just an absolute beast that Rhaegar becomes at those later levels. Um, why don't you see if you can get that Discord link, because mine's still being a little wonky, if, if we can get him in here. Let's see, who am I? In? Oh, I'll, I'll whisper it to you. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, by the Let's way, I'm, I'm going to uh, credit... Um, Dengstrom. The post-game interview is his baby, and I've stolen it from him. Um, so credit where credit due. Uh, that's the inspiration here. We had him do that in one of our games. He does it in some of his games, and I think it's a lot of fun. It allows uh, the audience, and we actually do have a little audience today, which is nice, the audience to uh, kind of maybe learn something, and, and me as a player and a caster, it, I think it's educational to learn from both teams. So uh, credit to Dengstrom, and thanks for allowing me to steal your idea. So we're just waiting for BO171, the ETC player, to come in here, and we can have a little chat. And we'll see if we can get somebody from West Coast Express in here as well. What's up, guys? Hey, how's it going, man? Going well. Good game? Yeah, no problem. I'm glad we could get in there and do it kind of last minute for you. Kind of cobbled it together, but it worked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, first things first, draft strategy. Did you guys kind of get what you wanted? Um, basically, usually um, we had a sub in for us today, so um, the guy that usually does our draft was not there. He kind of like retired you know, from pots to play golf. Well, that's a terrible decision. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. We just, we just messed around too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like he's, he's going to school now and stuff, so it's cool. But um, <clears throat> we basically got most of the stuff that we want. I usually tank. Which is uh, Bubble was our sub. He was the false dead. Played well. Uh, yeah, um, Miles is the, our support, and Dev is kind of like our flex player, so he plays pretty much every hero. So, um, yeah. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you guys tried to qualify for regionals, right? Yeah, and you, you won a couple games. So you got into the semis of one of them. Is that right? Or the quarters? You guys got pretty far in one of them. Yeah, um, I think we played three of them. And, uh, one, we got pretty far. We beat, like, I think we beat two teams. Or we got a bye, we, we beat a team. And then we played Vox, and we went 1-1 one, one against them, and they beat us in the third round. Yeah, I, I, um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys, or if, uh, you guys saw this. Um, but if you watch the Beyond the Nexus, I think Dredd mentioned you guys as kind of a surprising team that came out of nowhere. Did you, did you, did you hear that? Oh, or, my. I didn't, no, I didn't hear that. Oh, no, no, I'm I, sorry. I, I take it back. It wasn't Dredd. It was um, uh, TBK Zord on the Lords of the Storm podcast. They talk about the pro play, and he mentioned you guys kind of surprising people by advancing as far as you did. Nice. Yeah, so that was, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, um, yeah, it was super cool. We had fun. Like we had, we wanted to win. To be honest, like we were super upset that we lost. Yeah, yeah. especially to get that that close. Yeah, when you get that close too, that's got to be uh, disappointing. So, 
you, you, there's no way you would know this, but um, when I saw you guys on there, I actually told Jove, I was like, these guys don't need to do placement, man. You can just put them in the pro, pro division. Nice. Uh, nice. And a, a couple of other people told him that too, but uh, I guess he didn't believe us. Nah, man, good looking out. Yeah, dude, we, uh, we're just a new team, having fun. And, uh, you know, we just put a bunch of guys together and tried it out. And we, we feel like, you know, we got a pretty good... Uh, group of guys that we could just make it happen yeah so, i'm sure you guys will going. yeah i'm sure you guys will qualify for the pro division one of the cool things about chair league this is my third season in it so i've kind of been there since the, the infantile beginnings you know um this season there's so many big names going in the pro division you know with dunk and those guys making a team and team blaze being up there and you know last year there were a couple teams from chair league that tried to qualify for na like miasma um, so it's kind of cool to see that 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 pro there's some there's some really good play up there. So I'm sure you guys will, will get up there and and have some fun. Yeah, these guys. Let me turn my mic up real quick. Yeah, yeah. Okay, is that better? Yeah, there we go. I I, I turned you up a little bit on my end too. So it was actually on mute. <laughs> oh, wow! That, that's impressive that they could hear you I at mean, all then. Yeah, that that's crazy. Now, like we we realize like uh, if we start playing whatever and we're like, okay, we're pretty good. Let's make the team. Then we started to play these teams. Like some teams we play, like, like not to not to like say nothing bad about teams. We'll be like, okay, this is a free team for us. Right. You know, not to because you know that's like the lingo everybody uses. Sure. But, um, I swear when we when we played some like when we played the teams that you know been playing a little bit longer than us and maybe more talented or whatever they got a better team. We were like the free team to them. So it's crazy just to like play a team and just like dominate them and then just play another team and get dominated. Like it's like what happened. Like. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I mean. Like, you really realize like how good these teams are and like it's just it's pretty it's pretty cool because then you get to learn a lot and get to like okay well we need to really like do this and that and refocus and you know yeah see what they did well i had a similar experience not quite to the level of play that you guys were playing it but um mitchell and i have a new team this year but the team i played on the last two seasons we kind of just five randos off the internet we qualified for division one we played some divergent Game, you know, divergent tournaments, and man, we first got in there, and we were just getting slaughtered in these tournaments. And then we started slowly winning a couple games. We uh, played RFS Gaming three times. The first time they destroyed us. The second time they kind of just killed us a little bit. And the third time we were dominating them until we had an epic throw at the last minute and just totally threw the game, and we were all crushed. Um, but yeah, it's seeing that development of a team dynamic because. In competitive play, so much of it, I mean, of course, individual talent is important, but just as, if not more so, is that team dynamic and that chemistry as the players learn to play together. Why don't you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, man, I, I completely agree. I would say that's more, um, I would say that's single-handedly more important than just having individual talent, because anybody can be good at anything. I mean, you look at, like, even pro teams, like, not just even, say, gaming, for instance, but any baseball team, football team, any, any pro sports team, you put a new team together they're not like maybe they'd be good maybe this that but once you can get down like a good synergy with people and you can kind of like flow together and it can, it can change everything i think a big part is not just like getting on people like say someone makes a mistake or somebody throws a game or whatever it is like you really just got to be like you know what that can happen to anybody you know like that could uh that could be me that makes a mistake that could be someone else that makes a mistake and we just got to move forward and just forgive each other for our mistakes and grow together as a team and stay together because I think a lot of teams sometimes they be like, oh, this, that, you did this, you did that. They break up and they move on. They don't really maybe learn from their mistakes, so they just like blame other people. So, yeah, you've seen that a lot in NA with, NA with the roster apocalypses. You know, these guys just jumping all around teams, and it feels it feels like they're just not together long enough to really develop, you know, good synergy. And you know, we're on a tangent here a little bit now, but I think that's partially what happened to Gale Force trying to integrate fan. I think that chemistry just wasn't there yet that that last tournament. Right, I think fan is like. One of the, in my opinion, like if not the best player in the game, but going from team to team is just it's it's tough, dude, because you gotta learn everybody's styles, you gotta like adapt, you know, and it's just uh, yeah, and you know, Rafa not only do you have to adapt as the player too, everybody else has to adapt to fit around you. Absolutely, and that's man. that's just as hard. You know, and then they go from Rafflecopter, who all those guys had been playing with forever, to fan who's fantastic of course but i just i don't think they had time to develop that synergy i'm really curious to watch those guys as they go forward no uh, yeah hey I mean, we, in the show too when they played denial it was kind of just like just uh just wasn't there set up yeah you know, yeah hey we, we were talking during the game you guys made a couple of really aggressive calls this the early giant camp steal um the getting of the boss before collecting the third tribute 
Um, is that are is that calls you guys would normally have made in like a more competitive tournament, or is that something that maybe specifically as you get into chair league and you know maybe the teams aren't quite as good that you made more aggressive calls in that kind of environment? Yeah, that's um we do like like we do crazy stuff, man. Like we do stuff that normally like probably a lot of teams won't do. So we would do that versus any team realistically. Um, because I kind of feel like when you have an opportunity to take uh to do something like you can can make a play they usually got to make it and you can't really just sit around and be like oh we should do this we should do that like we just kind of just like um kind of do it sometimes it kind of is bad it could kind of bite us in the ass if you know what i'm saying but uh when it works out i mean you it just it can put us in a huge advantage you know so I don't think it would be, make a difference between it's like a bad team or a good team. Yeah, I think in this game specifically, because those guys just seem... Best play team. So. Yeah, yeah, this last game, those guys just seemed to be rocked on their heels in the beginning. I actually thought they fought pretty well, those last two team battles, considering how far down they were. But I think the, your shot calling was so aggressive, they weren't able to anticipate it, and it caught them off guard and put them on their back foot, and it really just snowballed after that. True. Yeah, we had, um, we had Miles totally mild shot calling for us usually it's edward torres so um yeah dude he just kind of just like when kind of like everybody shot calls in a way but if someone sees something like let's do this and everybody's kind of just like no one opposes it in the discord or in the chat like we just go for it you know we try not to really argue or just like like oh no don't do this and get into like stuff like that we just do it like someone says something just go do it you know so why don't you waste time and take time and just you know i don't know uh, do, do me a favor do, maybe Walk us through how you guys handle shot calling, because in both of the teams I've played with, you know, low-level competitive, you guys obviously went, you know, pretty far. How do you guys handle shot calling within the team? Um, do, you, do you separate maybe target shot calling versus strategic? Is it one guy that does both? How, how do you guys handle that dynamic? So with, like, target shot calling, it's just everybody. everybody if somebody sees a target out or usually, like, I'm, I'm playing the tank most of the time, so I'll call the targets out. So we'll, we'll go about it that way. But as far as, like, overall strategy throughout, like, what we should be doing, you know like objectives and this and that we have one person doing that or saying like okay this is happening so we need to do that but um for now, targets it's not just that one person it's pretty much everybody so now for your strategic shot caller how in depth does it does he go does he specifically say like hey false depth fly top clear that camp and then we'll meet you down here Did he, does he specifically call out individual players or is it more like hey we need to go down here um and then we need to do this or is he very specific about who he wants to do what yeah, so, I mean, our, our team name is Who Let Vince Play? So we have, like, a wild card on our team. So usually if Vince is talking, we just try and ignore him. Because he's just, like, <laughs> he's wild, bro. He might just say something. We should be like, man, what just happened? So which one's Vince? Yeah. Vince is um, Interconnect. Oh, the Artanis. It, it the, figures the Artanis, the Artanis player. Artanis, yeah. The silenced Artanis <laughs> player. His name is actually Artanis, but he just goes by Vince as an AKA. So <laughs> really just, that's just who he is. You know what I'm saying? But, um, nah, man. I mean, um, we don't try and... Edward, because he usually does it, he doesn't really, I don't know, man, he, he doesn't say too much, but he says enough to get the point across. Like, we won't sit there and just have, like, a whole debate over what we're talking about, but um, he'll kind of just keep it simple. We try and sim simplify it as much as we can, you know? and we don't try and, like, get into, like, someone else has some, someone else has some, because then you get into times where you're just talking too much. And nothing and gets done. Playing. Right. Yeah, exactly, you know? Hey, man. Well, I really appreciate the interview, uh, both because it was fun and I learned something. Uh, great game. Anytime you want me to cast, yeah. your guys just invite me on Chair League. If, if it's within my schedule, I have a little girl, so i got to schedule babysitting right. and stuff. But anytime, man, I'll be happy. Good. Welcome to Chair League. Great win. Cool. And uh, thanks for letting me cast you guys. Yeah, thank you, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in. We actually had a little bit of an audience tonight. That's always fun. Uh, casting to 10 people is way more than better than casting to two. Uh, Mitchell and I will be casting tomorrow night at uh, 7 o'clock. It'll be North versus uh, Sweet Synergy's second chair league team, the all-female uh, HOTS team. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter if you'd like. Both of us have our Twitter handles under our faces there. Um, and you can also follow us uh, on chair league. Chair league has like a social networking feature where you can follow uh, teams, players, casters. So you can follow us there if you'd like. And Mitchell, our first night casting together was fun. Yeah, that 
went really well. I'm uh, glad that I decided to do this with you. And you're right, uh, casting with two people is definitely a lot more fun sometimes than uh, just one person going for it. Well, and you know, I'll tell you, as, as a solo caster, the main problem, is I don't mind listening to myself talk, the main thing is, is when I have to um, set up the lobbies and the draft and do things on the computer, it's hard for me to do both. So it's nice to have somebody there to bounce stuff off and get a little back and forth and different perspective. Um, and it's just more fun. Doing is way more fun. Yeah, I, I agree. I also just want to say thank you for everybody who turned in for these games. Yeah, it was fun. I, I love interacting with the Twitch chat, and special shout-out to uh, Steel, our teammate who popped in there. So love seeing our teammates in there. Uh, our team is Hodor, if you want to follow us. We love, we love fans, too. So uh, thanks for the games, guys. Thanks for the players for letting us cast. And uh, have a wonderful night, everybody. And we'll see you tomorrow at 7 o'clock for a Division Three game, North versus Sweet Synergy. Good night, all.